afternoon, my friends. Good morning and perhaps even good evening. Thank you so much for dropping by and joining me for another super exciting session of In the Studio with Das 3D, the bootcamp episode. Wonderful to see you all. Uh, Tuna, thank you so much for wearing a mask for all our safety. I really appreciate that. And Casey, my goodness, it must be so, so super early for you in the morning, early Sunday morning. Casey is in Australia, if I read that correctly. My goodness, we have viewers from all around the world. It is super exciting to see you all. Today's episode is going to be all about getting started with Das Studio. And we've picked this topic because the Das Studio 5 is underway in development and we're planning to make a proper tutorial series as soon as that's released. The interface is going to change slightly, so we're, you know, we're planning that. But in the interim, we're not quite sure when it's ready for prime time yet. So we thought, hey, what we really need is an in-depth getting started guide that gets you up and running quickly here on the DAS channel. And that is what today's stream is all about. So if you're watching this as a recording, welcome, first of all. Uh, you're there, you can, there'll be chapter points in there that let you jump quickly to the points I'm discussing with time codes. So, you know, that's one thing. The other thing is if I'm going too fast or too slow, have a look at that little gear icon. It's only available on replays, but that lets you change the playback speed. So that lets you make me explain things a little bit faster, twice as fast, or much slower than I usually am Going. So there we go. I've got a good cup of coffee here, and uh, let's let's just get let's just get started. I have um, so uh, what what we're trying to do here is we're going to make these little profile pictures that you see here on the right hand side of the screen. Those are PFPs, and many of the NFP crowd hopefully are going to watch this who want to get started with their own version of profile pictures. They're fairly easy to make because you're only focusing on one part of your character. You're not focusing on the full body. So that means a lot of extra tweaking can be taken out of the equation, which is kind of cool. Let me show you a time lapse that I've made earlier of a character uh, that is called Young Minto. Uh, this is the typical workflow process in Das Studio. So this is about like 10, 15 times the speed. We start up with loading the character and then giving her something to where him or her or it depends on what you want to do there's also a posing aspect involved so you can either load a pose in from the library and you can tweak it later with tools i've just used the power pose tool here for that then it's usually about about um, uh, changing the expression of the character and making him or her look into a particular direction depends on the look and feel you're going for. Now here I'm going and accessorizing the character. So there's the glasses, there's the hair prop, and that gives me a bit of a feel of what, you know, how, how is this, what's, what's this going to look like? Um, now I'm setting up the camera. That's an important part that we're going to talk about because the perspective does make a difference when you're framing up portraits. And we're kind of there, final adjustments. You know, you, you adjust one thing, you've got to adjust the other thing. Now I'm setting a basic uh, light here, also saving my scene, very important. And I'll get a feel for what does this look like right now? With the default light, I try different light sets until I kind of settle on this darker background here. And that's nice, but now I think the colors of the character don't quite match with the background. So now I'm applying different materials to the sweater that she's wearing. There's also an issue with the bump map that's a little bit too strong. So that's what I'm correcting there right now on the surfaces tab. And then there's another little render. Oh yeah, then there's also clothed cloth draping, which often results in this, which isn't so good. So uh, yes, there we go. That uh, often needs to be redone. That's the deforce simulation. We won't talk about this today. Just know that it's there, cloth draping. And then I'll try out different light settings until I'm satisfied with the thing that I've got now. I'm changing the hair color here so that we have just black and red in there. Also, the little hair clip there that has a different color now matches the eyes, or sorry, matches the glasses. And that is pretty much it for the base character of the portrait. Now I'm thinking, hey, it'll be good if we just make that a bit more professional. I'll apply a bit of depth of field that makes this uh, hair just um, just be a bit blurred out here on the on the sides. And it looks really nice now. But now that I have a dark jumper and I've got a dark background, I need another light to separate the character and the hair from the background. And that's what I'm setting up now. So this is a this is a spotlight that I'll point at the character, and that gives me that nice little catch light here. <laughs> 
And that's the portrait. That's we're nearly done. All I do now is add a small vignette and some final color correction in Photoshop. And this is the final result. So there are, even though it looks like there's a lot of steps to it, and you know, there are, um, it is something that when you do it often enough, you know what to look for, you know how to solve these things. Um, but of course, uh, in so doing, you got to know your way around Das Studio. So that's what we're going to spend, I suppose, the first half an hour, almost 45 minutes with the interface, where is what in DAS Studio. So specifically, we're going to talk about interface. How do you get around? How do you get around the viewport? Where is content? How do you get it into your scene? What content uh, plays well with what other content? And um, finally, we're going to go and set a project like this up from scratch. We're going to go and uh, DAS have given you a very generous de uh, discount on something called the Icons, Best of Genesis 8 Males and Females Bundle. So this is something that we've picked because it contains a lot of funky products that if you don't have a lot of content yet for DAS Studio, this is going to really get you started. So uh, many of us uh, seasoned pros in DAS Studio will already own these figures. In particular, these are the ones here. Uh, there's uh, the Genesis base figures, male and female. They are actually free, so you can get started without this. But with this, you have more. So you have the Michael morph, you've got the Victoria morph, you've also got the underbelly morph, which is a wonderful kind of mafia kind of character, and you've got the Ico morph. So those are all morphs that will shape your base Genesis character into something else. They also come with material presets so that you have a different look and feel of the skin tone. Not only that, but you also get the HD add-ons here for both Michael and Victoria. Most importantly, you get these packages here, which you know look a little bit weird in the promos, but they're the body morphs and the head morphs, uh, both for Michael and Victoria. And you also get some expressions here, which is really important. You also get a couple of outfits, which is nice, and some stuff to accessorize your character. So these are some hair uh, props that you get and some sunglasses here, which is, these are great, actually. These are really good. Renderwelten, Renderwelten, Renderwelten made that. <laughs> good good content provider. So um, we're going to, this is something that they give you a good, good discount on. And, uh, you know, don't miss out. So these are things, these are really stock uh, bits and pieces that you will need uh, to to just get more out of your character. So we're going to talk about how to shape them, how to blend them together. But, you know, for all of that to start, we're going to have to start with the basics, and that is how do we get around DAS Studio? My moderators today, by the way, are Julia. She's manning Facebook. Hello, Julia. There's also Brian, a.k.a. Zero Calvin. Hello. He's here on YouTube. And then there's also Nate, a.k.a. Drago Nate. He's watching the Twitch. Yes, that is what we're all doing. If you have any questions that I can't address in the chat, if I don't spot it in the chat, I'm just keeping half an eye on it, then uh, please, uh, you're welcome, then please um, uh, just ask them and my moderators will consolidate them onto a little, you know, private board that we have. And towards the end of the stream, I'll have a look at that. And if I can help you out, I will. So when you start that Studio, um, there is, in fact, there's actually, if you if you are not at that point yet, if you want to install DAS Studio, there's a video on my personal channel that explains it. Uh, it's a fairly recent upload, Brian. If you can dig out that link, that'd be really good. So um, thank you, Camilla. That is actually, that's a really nice offer. Thanks. Yes, please feel free to to answer anyone else's questions and chip in. It's, uh, it's what I really appreciate about us as a community, that we all just chip in with bits and pieces. What I'm showing you is also not the only way of doing things. What I'm showing you is the way that works for me. But there's many, many other ways that, you know, lead to Rome and all that. So yes, if you've installed DAS Studio, it looks actually slightly different than this. I'm going to bring it back to that particular base. You do that up here under Window, Workspace, Select Layout. City Limits Light is currently the default layout that DAS Studio 4.16 comes with. This is the version I'm using. And if I hit that Accept button, then it looks like this. And this is a nice mixture between uh, most tools you'll need. In fact, they give you more tools than you'll need and more tools than we'll discuss today. Um, so that makes it slightly difficult to get your head around it. If you see this for the first time, you think, I don't know where to begin. What is what? I don't really, I don't, I don't, I, what do I do? And so for that reason, I'm going to close some of these palettes down and please work with me on this. In case you have a setup that you're currently working with and you would like to follow along, 
you can go over here to window workspace and then save your layout first. Then that's quite nice. If you've got something that you've got your heart set on, uh, save it as a layout and then go and select something like City Limits Lite that will reset it back to base. This is also good if you've made a mistake and you think, damn, I've used these palettes and I've just, I've lost them. I don't know where they are. Just set it back to City Limits Lite and start from there. And then, you know, save bits and pieces here. So um, the first thing I'll tell you about is these little palettes and how they work. So you can go and click on any of them to close a whole sidebar. That's quite nice. If you need a bit more real estate, screen real estate, you can do that. You can just click on them. And if you wanted to have them somewhere else, you can just left click and drag off these off the panes. There's no real preview, just a tiny little um, rectangular icon. Then when you let go, it'll just go and come right off here. And then you can resize it and reposition it and put it on a different monitor. If you're working with multiple monitors, you can literally spread this around and have your own 3D cockpit that you know that you that you like to uh, that you like to spread around. You can also put them back. So left click and drag, just put it back anywhere you like. So if I wanted my aux viewport somewhere over here, I can do that, or I can just you know bring it back to here or which is the thing that I'm going to do also position wise left click and drag to uh, onto another tab and this is where that tab's going to be. Aux viewport is a secondary viewport that you can watch your framed up camera in while you're running around the scene in another viewport or vice versa. I won't use it only because I have very limited screen real estate. I've got one screen and nothing else. So I'm going to right click here and hit on close pane and that's my aux viewport gone we're going to be totally fine without it the scene tab here that's the one i'll leave but environment i'll close so i'll kind of go around the the whole interface here at the bottom here we have parameters and this is one of the most important tabs in the whole interface so i'm going to encourage you to put that somewhere properly center i'm going to put it on the left hand side left click and drag that over here so that it is underneath my content library I'll go through here from there. This is we're going to sort out that side in a minute. The shaping tab I will close because those parameters I will actually come back to it later, but I will close it for now just so that we, you know, that, we, that we're all on the same level here. Close it down. Face transfer is another tab we're going to close down. I will also show you how to bring these things back, by the way. Posing tab I'm going to close. The surfaces tab is another important one. I encourage you to put that also somewhere safe. So left click and drag it over here so that it's on the left hand side. Then there's the lights and cameras tab and much like the shaping and the posing tabs, those things that are displayed there will be available on the parameters tab. So I'll show you how to do that. And you know, it's just, it's, for me, it's much easier to look in one place rather than in several places. Sometimes it makes sense to have certain parameters displayed in various tabs, but you know, it's something that you work out as you keep working with that studio. So one of the things that is valuable about this is that we as artists and creators, all of us have a different approach to how we work with that studio. And that is why it's important to have so much variation. So as I said, what works for me might not work for you, but we'll use this as a starting point. So on the left hand side, then here we do some, something similar here. There's the install tab, which is actually not necessary because it's kind of consolidated together on the smart content tab. So install tab, left click and drag, another tab gone. We need smart content and the content library because this is how we bring in uh, the content that we buy from the marketplaces and use in DAS Studio. So those things, they're very important. Parameters we've talked about also very important. Surfaces, very important. Keep that there. Draw settings is semi-important, but for the sake of brevity, I'm going to go and close this down as well. Then we have render settings. That's important. And then finally, we have simulation settings. And this is important for DeForce later. I might go and right click and drag that over here, but not really talk about it. It's just something that I'd like that I like to have out of the way, just accessible, just in case we do have a DeForce outfit. We want a DeForce app. We can totally do that with this. So it's that big blue button here simulate that's kind of important every once in a while much like the big blue render button on the render settings tab so that's one part sorted the other part is the toolbars so toolbars by default looks like this and it kind of really depends if you're an icon person or more like a menu person. I personally don't use any of these icons. As some of them, they're kind of here. These I use, but I don't use those. And as I said before, I'd like to 
get rid of clutter that uh, that would confuse me, especially when you're learning Desk Studio. It's, you know, I encourage you to try it out, but if you find like you're not using something, then get rid of it. If you find you're using something more and more, then, you know, put it into a more central position. So I'm gonna switch this around a little bit under Window Workspace Customize down here. And I will go to the right-hand side where it says Activities, that says Advanced. I'll open that up and there I see two bars. If I open that up, I see that there's actually two toolbars that are available. Once the main toolbar, that's the one that is displayed right now, the, the whole top toolbar, and then the other one is Tools. So I'll go and right-click on the main one, disable it, and then I'll right-click on the Tools bar and enable it. And then I hit uh, Apply, and then things just get shuffled around a little bit, and I hit Accept, and then I only have the tools that I really need in Dash Studio and nothing else. Everything else is still accessible from the menu. So that's you know important to remember. Everything is accessible from the menus as well as icons, you know, just in case one of those things. And yes, it is available, Stephen. It is available to watch later, in fact, on YouTube. So yes, this is going to stay here for a while. And hopefully it's going to be de the de facto getting started guide with Dash Studio. I'd appreciate that if that were to happen. So that's that. There might also be in the bottom right hand corner, there might be something called the lesson strip. You can enable and disable that under here, window workspace, enable lesson strip. If you see something like this at the bottom right and you'd rather not see it, again, this gets rid of a few pixels. I know I'm a little bit, you know, pernickety, but that is, that's how you get rid of that. And now, once you've done that, head over to window workspace and save this layout as something else. I might just call it stream demo. Oops. And then it's saved. So if you wanted to switch between multiple workspaces, you can. Also note that you can change the look and feel of Dash Studio. I'll just quickly show you where that is before we get started. That is under workspace and sorry, under style, window style, there's select style here. And what we're currently using is the theme called dark side. There's three themes with a preview here. There's dark side, highway, and main street. And if you use that, and I just click preview here on main street, you'll see that the position of the palettes all remains in the same space, but the kind of the look and feel of Dash Studio changes significantly. So lighter interfaces have kind of fallen out of favor, I guess. Just know it's there. I'm not going to use it. I'm going to hit cancel. Just know that, uh, you know, you can change the look and feel of Dash Studio to a certain extent. PPC, I totally agree. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> well, they, they, see, this is why we say um, save it. And uh, should should you close that studio, it should actually save it. But just in case it hasn't done that, you can at least pick it back. Okay, next thing on the agenda, uh, this little white border here, I'm going to go and close that for now. It's the show aspect frame in this little hamburger icon up here. This shows you what's going to end up on the final render. I'm just going to go and remove that just again, once once again, a little bit less clutter. And then we can move on to how do we get around what, what is what in Dash Studio now that we've set up our palettes here. So, so the most important thing in Dash Studio is the viewport. That's this thing in the center here, viewport, there it is. It can have multiple configurations. You can have multiple views at the same time, up to four, I believe. There's also the auxiliary viewport, which is a separate panel that you can look at your scene in. And this is essentially the window to our world. We can look at our scene from several sides here. That's up here under perspective view. That's usually kind of our running around view. If we, as you know, the creator, want to look at our scene from several different points. There's other um, views here, like the front, left, right, back, top, and bottom views that you might need every once in a while when you line things up. Let me give you a concrete example here. I'll go and bring in something like a cube. I'll head over to Create, New Primitive, and I'll go and bring in a cube. And there he is. That's the cube. He is a little bit um, white and blown out. I'm going to head. I'm going to click him. Head over to the surfaces tab, and I'll just give him a little color here. Nothing, nothing fancy. Just so that you know, hey, that looks much more friendly. Or maybe we'll give him well something, something like this. Make him even darker. There we go. I like that. 
So to get around the viewport and look at all sides of the cube, we have in fact another cube, but we also have little icons on the right hand side and they they both work. Uh, I'll show you, I'll give you a quick rundown. Left click and drag on the top guy to rotate around my object. You can left click and drag on the second person here. That is the pan. So that means you can shift things left, right, uh, top and bottom. Then there's of course the zoom and I'll do all that without my without using my left hand. This is all like a left click and drag affair. So left click and drag uh, up and down to zoom in or out. It's actually not quite zooming. It's more dollying. So if you're familiar with digital photography, zooming is actually the changing the um, focal length of your camera. But dollying is basically coming closer to the object and going further away. That has important implications that I will talk about later. This little square here, this is kind of a good example. If I left click and drag and have moved my cube out of the way, if I select it and hit this little square button, then it goes and comes back right into the center of the scene. That's kind of nice. So if you wanted to, if you select something in the scene view, uh, like, you know, a, a small item of your character, you can uh, select that and then just go click this thing. And then finally, this thing, the arrow at the bottom, if you've messed around with greatly with your um, viewport and maybe you've done this and you've seen seriously done harm to the perspective and you know things look uh, ever so slightly terrible and you think I don't know what I did there you can click this little arrow and that'll just reset your viewport to something that you may have inadvertently um, you know balked up that that can happen so but this is a, oh yeah the, the cube here this this um, uh, this this colorful cube here, left click and drag it to do more or less exactly the same as this little arrow icon here. But you can also just click on the front or the top or the bottom and then Das Studio will kind of move it into place. This is kind of nice. If you want it to look exactly from the left or exactly from the front, you can click that and you know, you're know you looking at exactly this uh, with the perspective still. So it's one of those things. This is important to, um, to remember that we still see foreshortening in the viewport, which is the the suggestion that this is 3D. So in in much in concrete terms, if I'm really pernickety about this line of the cube here and this line of the cube, I know that the cube probably displays them, they're, they're the same length, right? But if I look at it, depending on the focal length, technically I see this line shorter now than this line. And that's because my viewport is drawing perspective. So technically I don't see an orthographic cube. I will see it kind of converging to the back ever so slightly. And it's the same with the, with the grid. If you look at a grid space uh, in the front, this line is longer than this line. And this is a foreshortening that is drawn from the render engine, currently filament, that um, that, that we need to see in order to uh, you know get uh, the impression of perspective, that objects look natural. Sometimes though, when we want to line things up, we don't want to see that because that really gets in the way. So if you stack something on top of one another, then you might not see the perspective. You might not want to see the perspective. This cube here is a great example because the middle of that shows me the center middle of my bottom face of the cube. Now, if I wanted to put this directly on the bottom of my 3D world, I can't really see if that's happening. I mean, is uh, I can move the cube like this, by the way, with a little universal manipulator. I can't really tell. Is it on the bottom now or is it on the bottom now? I can't really tell because, you know, even if I look straight from the left, whoops, straight from the left, I don't really know. I mean, is it on the bottom or is, or is it is it more like, is, is this on the bottom? I can't, I can't really. Is it, is it, maybe is this on the bottom? No, that's not really on the bottom. So how do I do that? I can change over to these orthographic views, which draw without perspective. So if I look at the front, then I can see that this uh, this line here at the very bottom, that is in fact my grid. And the cube is now below the grid. So only if I switch to one of these orthographic views can I go and line up my cube properly. Very important. If you've got lots of uh, objects in your scene and you want to uh, you want to stack them up, this is what you have to do. Sometimes switch to these orthographic views. Usually we run around in the perspective view. And that's pretty much it. There's another way of navigating. You, you will see that I'll use my left hand to navigate because there's shortcut keys. I, it's very inefficient to, uh, to only use these icons because you move away from things all the time. So if you're into shortcuts, control and alt plus left click anywhere in the viewport 
will also navigate you around, like rotate you around the object. And that's what I usually do. Likewise, once again, Control and Alt and the right mouse button pans your view. That's important. So this is what I do. And then just use the, the mouse wheel, scroll it up and down to go dolly closer or further away from your object. That's navigation. And uh, you can also use this here, the framing things up. That is Control F for frame things up. So that's that's neat. If you ever lose something, Control F will bring you right back. And you will see me use this quite frequently when I when I line things up in the viewport. <laughs> World class balker, Jeremy. That's exciting. I think me too. Amy Rose, welcome. I'm so glad you could make it. Wonderful to see you all. It's really, really nice to see you all. Let's start with something uh, that is much more important than looking at cubes and how to run around them. You know, we're going we're gonna to do much more exciting things in a minute. Uh, in fact, I'm going to go and delete my cube, which can just happen with selecting something either in the scene or in the viewport and then hit delete or backspace on the Mac or vice versa. Uh, and then, you know, objects will disappear. You can also right click on an object with this particular tool selected here. So this, yeah, this may be a good idea to speak about tools. So this one here, that is called the universal manipulator. And it's called that because it brings three things into one. It, br it lets us position things. It lets us rotate things. It lets us scale things. So those are things that we'll frequently do with objects. Um, rotation and um, positioning more so than scaling, but all of these three are combined on one tool. You can also get this from the tools menu. It's called universal. That's our universal manipulator. It can be split up into three different ones, namely rotate, translate, and scale. Each of these will behave much like the universal one, but only for one particular thing. So this would only rotate object, this would only translate object, objects and this will only scale objects. So it depends on your preference. I tend to just stick with the universal manipulator and it can do quite funky things. So let me show you, um, let me show you some of those. If you needed to move this cube out of the way, you can move it by hovering over this little triangle at the very top of these arrows here and that moves them in exactly this one axis. So in Das Studio, uh, X, X and uh, Z are the ground plane and then Y is the up axis. Looks like 3D applications are kind of split 50-50. Some prefer to use Z like Blender in the up axis, but that still uses Y. It literally is 50-50. It's like it's a bit like um, you know, traffic in the world. Is it is is it correct to drive on the right hand side or on the left hand side? It's, neither is correct or incorrect. It's just a different way of working. You can also move an item uh, that you've selected in more than one axis. Control Z will undo this by using these little triangle icons. So left click and drag on those and you move your object along two axes. So I'm not doing up and down. I'm only using uh, the X and Z at the same time. And that makes positioning very easy. That's quite nice. And you can do this with all axes. So you can do, you can do this, for example. So this would be uh, X and Y, but not Sorry, X and yeah, X and Y, but not Z. And again, it's uh, it's when you're dealing with the three D world. Sometimes it's difficult to see where you're actually going or to catch these little guys in the act. But yeah, there we go. I'm basically moving it down there and up here, but not left and right, if you know what I mean. I suggest you practice this. So practice makes perfect. Don't be afraid to just sit there and take this in because you use this all the time. And once you've internalized how this works, you're going to be flying around Das Studio in, in no time. Let me go and delete my cube now and show you content. So content is really what makes Das Studio totally shine. And the whole Das ecosystem is just fantastic. So you can think of the content store and Das Studio as a little bit like a box of Legos, which is, you know, why I'm actually wearing my new Lego t-shirt here, the little Lego guy. You build pieces, you buy pieces from the store and you assemble them together in your own projects. It's so cool. I grabbed two because, you know, I really like Lego. And this is kind of what that reminds me of, that you bring your, you build your scene together and, uh, and build something out of nothing with your creative vision. And for that, we need content. And not just 
all, I mean, there's all kinds of content is available, but, uh, but what DAS really specializes on is characters, photorealistic human characters, as well as creatures of all kinds. So aliens, pirates, and, you know, people with scars and non-binary characters, you literally, you name it, it's there. And for anything that's not there, you can blend these things together. So to make sense of that statement, uh, we'll, we'll have a look at content currently. So there's something, oh yeah, we can go close this down here. Go to install, go to figures, and I'll untick this box. I'll, I'll talk to you about how this all works and plays together. These are all the figures that I've installed on my smart content. Uh, and one of these products is this blue thing here, which is the Genesis 8 Starter Essentials. And that is essentially a human figure morph, actually two human figure morphs, one for the female, one for the male. And when you load that in, depending on what's installed, different types of sliders will come up in your parameters menu. And they will be able to shape this form into different things, like, you know, a more rotund guy, maybe a dwarf, maybe an alien, that sort of thing. That's one thing that these guys can do. This is free, by the way, the Genesis 8 Starter Essentials. Then on top of that, there's what's known as material presets or shaders, and they will paint something on the outside of this shape. Together, this will make up um, a, a human character or a creature or whatever. When you buy a custom character, then those are based on these figures. So really, if I if I double click on George here now, then uh, George or Michael or you know any of these guys, they are in fact loading in that Genesis 8 male base figure, and they're also applying a morph to it to turn it into the shape that George is, or Victoria, or Michael, or any of these people. All of them are sliders that are technically, I don't want to make it too complex, but they're technically um, morph targets in a base geometry. As you shift it, the vertices that make up that shape move around. And the beauty of that is that you can mix and match them. You can blend them. You can blend George and Michael together to make something like a 50-50 version or a 20-80 version or even throw in other characters. So this concept is important to understand about the Genesis figure because that's somewhat unique. Uh, if you look at most 3D content that comes in as one thing and if you need something like a, like a chair for example, if you need something else then you'd bring in a different object and that has a completely different topology, a different material zones and they're not compatible. But, you know, together they make up a scene, namely a chair and a, and, a, and a table. But you can't morph the chair into the table unless you're really fancy, and usually people don't do that. But with the Genesis figure, this is something that's been introduced in the Genesis 1 figure all the way back in... 2006, 8, 7, something like that, 2008 maybe. Uh, th that is a unique concept that was, in, that was introduced. One base mesh and everything you do from it is just a shape. And that also means things are compatible with one another. So a jacket that fits Michael will also fit George within reason. You know, there's always a little bit of stretching going on, but Das Studio tries its best to make that happen. Let's look at a concrete example. I will go and uh, maybe start with my man Michael. I think Michael is here somewhere. There it is, Michael 8. If I double click him, then I can go. Oh, yeah, actually, this is, I need to tell you this. This is in the smart content tab. If I just show you Michael quickly, then we'll come back to content and how a smart content versus content library works. So double click Michael. Michael has these entries here, either all files or he has anatomy or he has figures, or he has materials. So all files means I see everything that's in this Michael product. If I just want to load in a figure, I head over to figures, and that's my Michael actor. If I double click him, then he will be loaded into the scene. If I select him, then things will be filtered out depending on what fits with Michael in smart content will be shown in the, in the uh, smart content library. And then with Michael, I can then add things like different eyebrows. I can apply uh, somebody else's skin texture and so forth. This is a little bit blown out. So <laughs> that means I need to introduce you to something else in Das Studio, which is uh, how things appear that, um, that are in the viewport. I might just give him a little bit of underwear here because that's just, that's just a very sad story. Just so briefly, I head over to wardrobe and pick whatever I'd like uh, Michael to wear. So now 
this comes in handy here, filter by content. I'll use the Genesis 8 starter essentials because they come with, you know, fancy boxer shorts. So with the figure selected, you double click on an item of clothing and it snaps right on to Michael. And we don't see that here because it's parented to Michael. When I move Michael, which we'll do in a minute, it, the, his underpants will move with him, which is kind of cool. So um, that's kind of the, the beauty of conforming clothing there. So um, just to make him less blown out, we have different view, view modes in the viewport here. So there's, uh, this was our this is where what we what we look at, and this is right next to it is how that is displayed. So the easy, the, the simplest thing is to display things as that. So that's basically you know nothing. Or there's also the uh, solid bounding box. That's you know that's the the outer shape of the object. We usually deal with these things down here. There's filament. That's a very fast preview render engine that is okay, but it doesn't show you all the features that the high-res render engine would show you, which is the one at the bottom, which is NVIDIA iRay. If I switch to that, it'll take my computer a second to cook this up, but it'll have a very accurate representation of what Michael looks like. But the downside is that it takes my computer so long to calculate that if I go and move around him, in fact, it can't keep up. So it's, it's one of those things. That's why we usually only switch over to iRay when we want to uh, when we want to preview something for real. And when we put our scene together, we go and work in these different viewports here, view modes. But you'll see that he's much less blown out than he was with uh, with filament here. If I switch back, it takes a second. So it's not accurate lighting representation. We'll talk about that later. There's a third one here, which I like using, which is the texture shaded view. That's technically, those are three different render engines here that DAS Studio switches between. And this, again, this is an approximation. This has been in DAS Studio for, for ages, but it lets us kind of see-ish what our composition looks like. Always keep in mind, this is not the final result. This is just something that lets us move around fast. And, um, you know, that's that's why that's there. It's fast, it's not accurate. The other one is super accurate, but it's it's heavy on your, on your hardware. So there we go. Righty, so here's Michael. If I go and uh, this is kind of the, the, the highlight I wanted to show you. If I select Michael up here and I go and head over to my parameters tab now, I'll show you where these morph sliders are that I've been talking about. So we, we saw me closing down the shaping tab. They're also on the shaping tab, but if you head over here into actor, and I'll close this down here. Under actor, we have this full body here. And full body is in fact all the full body morphs. These up here are people. These down here at the bottom of the list, those are shapes of the body that I can tune in. Like, you know, maybe I want to make Michael a little bit heavy so I can left click and drag the heavy slider and Michael turns fat. So, you know, gains a few pounds here. Also, I can turn Michael into a fitness guy so I can just go and left click the, whoops, no, not the fitness, fitness crank that up. That was uh, the idea. He's getting a little bit fitter here. He's getting toned. I can also make him the other way around. I can turn him into an emaciated guy. Emaciated guy. I think that's how you pronounce that. Or we can go and turn him into a bodybuilder. And so this is what you can do with DAS characters. And the beauty of this is that the rigging and the materials and all the complicated setup is that that all stays in place. You don't have to load in a second figure that now looks different. So that's that's kind of the beauty of it. Those those are things that you can dial in and literally build your uh, your own special character with it. You'll see here that I have a morph that's called the Michael 8 body morph. And if I left click and drag that, you'll see that my Michael guy, or at least his body, turns into the base Genesis guy. So at the far end on the left, I have the figure that was that used to be the, the Genesis 8 base character had I loaded that in. And by cranking up this slider, I turn this body into Michael's body. That's kind of cool. I have other bodies here like Ichabod's body. If I turn him up, this is another custom character. It changes shape. There's also Holt. And I suppose they're all very unpronounced, but if I go and use something like Hitoshi, so that's Hitoshi strong body. Sorry, that's a different one. Uh, Hitoshi is installed. There's the brute. This is more pronounced. Let me try the brute. It's a very different body shape. So the cool thing about this is that I can go and mix 
30% of the brood and maybe 30% of Michael in and maybe 30% of Underbelly and then go and have a completely different custom character that I haven't had before. And this is really what makes Das Studio shine. And this is why you can create so many different types of profile pictures. Usually the body morph is separated from the head morph that you have essentially three sliders. One is the complete figure, one's the head morph and one's the body morph. So sometimes you want to just mold a face, sometimes you want to change the body shape of a character and these things let you do that. Let me go and reset these sliders here. If you wanted to ever reset any of these sliders that you come across in Das Studio, hold down Alt and left click on this. That'll set these sliders back to zero. So Alt, left click, that'll set this back to zero. In my case, Michael's body is set to 100% because this is basically the reset for Michael. So I have people here as well. So under people, I see the full body slider. So if I go and say the brute now under people, I will see that not only my body changes, but also my character's size and my character's face here. So that's, um, that's why there's different things. So this is the combined head morph as well as the body morph. Previously, we were just looking at the body morph and we can look at the head morphs as well. That's over here under head. We have the, we have the people portion and here I can dial in the brute just the head morph here if I can zoom in there I can totally show you this better thanks to that shortcut we've just learned about control F so this is how I can change his body shape his head shape but you know and this is where this this the, the, like the fun is only just beginning the more products you have the more sliders you have available and it's just hours of fun so this is now only the brute and this is the brute with the michael head and i can also have michael and brute 50 percent, and maybe also mix in a little bit of edward completely different guys or mix in a little bit of george you'd think george original head where's george the other head or hold. So very, very different variations here. So this is how these body sliders work. But really, if you're, if you're loading in a custom character from your library, then these will be applied already. So let me do this again here. And if I go and uh, undo Michael and go back to my library and load in somebody like the Brute, just double click him, then he's going to load in with the, with the Brute morph applied already. And absolutely, Steph, this is exactly why that's so important. So it's uh, you can literally go and build something that is so unique and so cool. So I'll, I'll show you one other thing in a minute uh, that will just that will just make you that will just I, for me, this is kind of unbelievable. And you just have hours of fun with this kind of stuff. So I'll go. Let me go and undo this and load in the Genesis 8 male uh, base character. In fact, let me load in something else. Let me load in my own product, which is called uh, Stream Safe Textures. This is something I've made for demo purposes because we're on uh, we're on YouTube. YouTube isn't good with nudity, and we don't want to tread the line. So, literally, Stream Safe Textures is essentially the Genesis Eight basic female with painted on underwear. And I like using her because she looks uh, she looks handsome in filament, and I can show you all kinds of uh, morphs that that we can do with the with the female figure as well. So these are two different uh, base meshes: the male figure and the female figure. So if you have male morphs installed, they won't work in the female figure, and vice versa. So what you buy for a female of a particular generation will work with that, but it won't work on the male figure. Just you know, just so that we're clear on this. So one of my favorite products is actually by 3D Universe and it's called Toon Generations and it'll turn this character into a toon and I can either load this in uh, from the content library or more importantly I can go over to my parameters tab and see if I can find that here. So under I'm going to go with the full um, full body here so under actor people I will go and say stylized and this is uh, this is one thing that I really love. Enable TG4. Uh, if you enable that, it turns your character into a toon. And that's kind of nice. You get the, the body proportions are different. You've got the larger head, you got the larger eyes, which is kind of cool. And um, but where you said family resemblance of, of different people, 
3D Universe is one of those vendors you, you think, oh my God, how did you do that? There's this slider here, TG4 Age, and that will literally age your character and change all kinds of attributes on it. So currently the default value is 21. So I suppose that's kind of her age, you know, two generations age. If I go and, and watch the figure, if I go and left click and drag this over to the left, she turns into a little girl and into, in fact, a baby. And you can you can just animate the slider as well. You can do this into, you can put this into any age you want. This is kind of eight, nine now it says. We're back at 15, 16, we're back at kind of 21. But watch what happens when I slide it to the right. She goes and grows older, older, older. Now she's kind of in her 50s and now she's a senior, age 60. Isn't that amazing? That is just so cool. And it's one figure and all the clothing that you put on it will still fit, which is just unbelievable. It's just so cool. So that's two generations and all of these things are morphs and i'm showing you this because this is really this is a highlight of that studio dial in the age that you want there's also something by um by zevo that's a product that does this for photorealistic characters something similar i don't know if it's if it's quite going to the baby or to the senior but it certainly has an age range so that's the the what are they called again zevo's products they are called I own it, I don't remember. Growing Up, that's it. Growing Up by Zevo. That does this for photorealistic characters. So very, very cool. I'm going to set this back to zero and this also back to zero and show you some of the other uh, shapes that you can blend together before we go on with putting clothing on our characters. You can do this before or after this. You can put clothing on now and then shape your character. Just be aware that as you do this, you might you might run into this problem that the more your computer has to move, the more lag there is between you moving a slider and you seeing an effect. And, you know, it's just it's just how the cookie crumbles, I suppose, more vertices to calculate and whatever. Tomb Princess, for example, that's that's one by Joe Quick. And she, of course, comes with her own uh, skin templates. But you can see the power that you can just morph these things together. Sakura is a is a tomb figure as well. She has special eyes as well. If you load her in, she's got these these uh, dedicated anime eyes. And then there's Rin. Rin's kind of a half realistic um manga figure and this mica mica has elf ears that can also be dialed in or out um you know independent from the body which is kind of cool and then there's Ico, which is also kind of an anime type um figure but again you can you can blend these things together if you see this like i'm moving the Ico slider and it, it kind of it, it's not fluid when i'm doing this this is because there's something else we need to talk about on the Genesis figure, it is actually less high resolution than it currently appears. And this is an important concept to understand because there's the base geometry, which is literally the vertices. If you look at the wireframe data here, these are these are the individual faces. They're anything that's kind of um, dark or kind of black overdrawn here. These are the actual polygons that make up the figure. But you also have these little gray lines here. And those are what we call implied polygons. And this is geometry that is applied on the fly to make the character look more high res. And that's a good way of making something smoother than it really is. It also means you're saving a lot of um, uh, storage space and processing power because you can just deal with the base resolution. But with the subdivision on, it means my computer needs to work four times as hard as it would if that is switched off. So let me show you where that is with your figure with objects um, enabled that with, with objects that have it enabled. You head over once again to the all important parameters tab and then head over here to general under mesh resolution. And this is currently set to high resolution. This is something that while I work, I like to turn this to base resolution only because the end result in high resolution isn't going to be important for me while I work. So I'll go and switch this to base and you'll see that the eyes, sorry, the ears get a little bit chunky there. If I switch between this, this is high resolution and this is base resolution. You see, especially ears get a bit chunky, but we also lose these black lines that we had here. That is, you know, where the where that uh, resolution would be just drawn on that you know what's implied and what's real. On the Genesis 8.0 character, by default, we have this enabled, high resolution. 
on the 8.1 figure, which is kind of the, the updated version of Genesis 8, which is backwards compatible with Genesis 8.0, we have a subdivision level resolution level that is cranked up to two to just imply more polygons. So this is what a Genesis 8.1 character will look like. And see that there's all of a sudden we have 16 additional polygons where there was only one before. And this now means that if I crank up a slider and move it, my computer is going to be working 16 times as hard as in the base resolution. So if you fiddle with sliders and you think my computer is too slow, it's not really that. It's just that Das Studio is applying more resolution than you need while you work. So in order to switch this back, that's that's um, select the object or the figure under parameters, mesh resolution, and then under resolution level, set this to base. And then quad error demonstrandum, if I go and switch this back to uh, filament here, I go and play once again with the ICO slider. And then you'll see that my computer is actually, he says, <laughs> a little bit, a little bit faster than it was before. Not much faster. Super disappointed now. I find I do this a lot, switching between resolutions. And I'm doing this so much so that I've actually bought a product by 3D Universe that's called Scene Tools. The three parts of it. I believe they're currently on sale and they are nice because they give you additional toolbars here. This is what I like using and I just wanted to mention that because this kind of rounds out my tour of the interface uh, before we get to working with these characters and putting a portrait together. Um, that is something that I enable and usually that is found I believe under utilities. No, it's not under utilities. It's under scripts. No, it's not. It's under utilities. Yeah, there we go. With that filter button disabled. I'll, I'll explain more of that later. So these are the ones here. Scene tools uh, set one, two, and three. And I like them because they have all kinds of different little things that you can kick off as scripts. All these scripts can also be docked up into the tool palette. So if I go and double click this, then I have this additional toolbar here. And that is usually what I like doing because one of them the with, that comes with the scene tool set one. I recommend all three, but if you want to just, you know, have a look at it, scene tool set one has this super important icon up here that switches my all my characters and clothing in the scene from high res to base res. So if I go and uh, just do this again, under mesh resolution. So by default, it's set to high. And this is more and more important than ever with the 8.1 characters, which have so much subdivision applied that it's it's just difficult for my computer to handle. If I go and add something else parented to the character, if I click this icon, then it'll take a moment and that script will just take care of making everything base rest, letting me know that as well with that little red dot. Save. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Yes, I'll, I will try and save as I as I build my project. Let me go and turn this back to uh, one. I'll leave it on low resolution for now. No, in fact, I'm going to I'm going to go put it back to high resolution and I'm going to go and put my stylized character back to uh, zero and just work with the Genesis 8 female base figure for now. And let's have a look at some of the how, how content works. We've already talked about that there's two different types of content, that there's smart content and the content library. And I find both of these equally important. So both tabs uh, do have, a, have an important mission for me. A content library is essentially a file browser that lets you traverse your content library directories and it will it will show you whatever files are loadable in Das Studio. But this here, all this on the right, on the left hand side, that is essentially the the hierarchy of your of your Das Studio library. It, if you look into that folder, you will find subfolders called Any Blocks, Animals, Environments, and so forth. And under People, you could open that. You have the various generations of Genesis that that you have installed, and then there's Genesis 8 female, for example. And then under here, I have these icons that will load my Genesis 8 base female and 8.1 base female characters. So they're different objects. Under here, I also have characters and under characters, I have all the people I have installed. And if I go and double click on one, it'll load in that character. But it being a file browser, and this is this how this works for wardrobe and for hair and for lights and all that. The trouble with a file browser is that 
you spend a lot of time looking in places if you're not entirely sure what fits with what. So I might have something like a Genesis 2 outfit, which technically doesn't fit on Genesis 8, or I might have a material preset for glasses that might not necessarily fit on a t-shirt and so forth. So the content browser can't really show you this. But smart content can do that because it acts as a, a database. So it has, it knows, hey, this object here is a Genesis 8 female figure. Therefore, everything that's tagged with Genesis 8 female will work on this. That means all morphs. So that means the male morphs aren't showing up when I filter them out. That also means my Genesis 2 morphs aren't showing up. So it only shows me content that is grouped together, if you wish. And let me show you where that is and how that works. That's on the Smart Content tab. And if I'm thinking, so there's this little um, icon at the bottom here, that's called filter by context. If that is enabled, watch what happens to most of my content here. It will go and disappear because only these products are currently available with this selected figure here. So it will tell smart content, hey, whatever is selected, filter me things that are compatible with the currently selected object. If I select like, you know, environment options, for example, then only two objects come up. If I select tone map objects, I, I, nothing should show up. Quite interesting that it does. And then if I select nothing over here, if I just click in this gray space here, then many more products should technically show up if I were in something here. Bad example, like figures, for example. If I go and select figures with nothing selected, I will see things like the cartoon chameleon here, and I will see the men, which are not compatible with the woman. The moment I select my figure, most of these will disappear, and I only see my women. And of course, this is happening as well if I have a male character in there and I select him, all my women will disappear because those are not quite compatible. So this is how smart content works and works with people. It works with other things like, you know, accessories that you have. It works with clothing items and so forth. So if I wanted to put a different skin texture on this character, I can go over to materials and then only the available or the compatible products will be shown now, uh, including underbelly, which is interesting. <laughs> Maybe we should try that. <laughs> does he have, does he, underbelly all maps works on, on my woman, really? That is interesting. It does. Oh my. <laughs> well, almost. Almost. I think I need that cross figure, um, that cross figure, uh, what's it called? The cross figure guide to turn that, um, to turn that uh, UV map into one that fits my female character. This is, I didn't know this. This is great. This is exciting. Control Z will undo that. Wow. I didn't know that. That's clever. <laughs> That is clever. So that's how smart content works. It filters out the things that will be available. So if I wanted to turn her into Mrs. Chow's skin details, I can just click that and apply all of Mrs. Chow's maps on here, even though I'm not applying the, the, um, the shape to her. Same with eye colors and stuff. If I wanted to give her um, purple eyes, I can do that. Often with materials, there's two types of materials. There's RSL and MDL. Those that's for different render engines. We have essentially we have four render engines in Dash Studio. MDL is IRA materials. That's the material definition language. That's the language that IRA understands. RSL is the render man shading language. That's the stuff that 3D Light understands. Those are two very different high-res render engines. One's GPU based, one's CPU based. You can render IRA on a CPU, but it takes it takes a bit of time. We'll talk more about this. Just sometimes you'll see if I'm talking about purple eyes, I have two of these options here. And um, if you drill this down, you'll see that there's an IRA section and that filters out the IRA material. So if, if we're talking about materials, make sure you're, you're looking in that uh, other than if you are applying something like the RSL materials that may not, might not look as good as the IRA materials. So MDL is IRA to take away here. Let's double click this and then the eyes will change or turn it into, you know, blue eyed woman or green eyed woman. There we go. So that's how that's how you can apply uh, materials to, to particular things that are currently selected. Let me do purple eyes. I like that. Let's take a look at clothing. So clothing in the smart content tab is available in the wardrobe section. And once again, with the smart content enabled here, filter by context, everything that should work on my character will now be displayed. If I untick this, 
then I get a much longer list, including male outfits and outfits for all the generation characters that might need converting to be able to fit on my figure. So I'll enable this and go and have a look what I've got here. Maybe the banana suit, the adventurer outfit. There's so many things that I could try. Maybe I'll try... Maybe I'll try uh, the tactical outfit. That's from the from the bundle here. This is actually kind of good. So, so yeah, tactical assault outfit. It's on the bottom here. This is currently listed alphabetically. By the way, you can list this differently if you find that cumbersome, if you're not finding the content that you like. There's this menu at the top here, just to round out the what what's happening with content and stuff. This is by default, it's set to sort by name A to Z. But you can also sort this by most recently installed, for example. So this is great if you've just bought something and you think, hey, I've, uh, I've bought it just now, I've installed it. I want to play with it right away. You can sort this by recently installed, most recent first, and then the list will look very differently. So I've got Young Minto here. I've bought her yesterday morning, by the way. Superb deal that I picked up there with a couple of other things. And I thought, yeah, this, this is now at the very top. But of course, Young Minto beginning with a Y would usually only be at the bottom if I'd listed alphabetically, but that would mean I wouldn't be able to find her so easily. So there we go. So I'll put it back to, no, in fact, I'll go, I'll leave it under install date. There's also order date. You can use the reverse order and everything. I'm going to go install date just so, you know, that technical outfit is then at the, at the top here. If you ever want to search something, you can also do that by the search menu here. So if I'm thinking I have my tactical outfit is here somewhere, but I don't know where it is because I, I can't, I've got so much content, I can't find it anymore. Just type it in tech tickle and then the whole list will be filtered with whatever is typed in here in that search field. So very, very handy tool to finding content. Um, it also works uh, sensitively depending on what's selected. So currently anything beginning with tag in my wardrobe section will come up, but I might have something that's not wardrobe. Maybe I've got a character that starts with tag. You know, or maybe I'll try, I'll, I'll show you the other way around, maybe with UN. If I type in UN, I have uh, wardrobe items containing UN here, but I don't have underbelly, for example. So underbelly would only show up if I go into figures or if I go into, no, not even that. If I go into materials, then underbelly shows up because the, the his figure isn't compatible with that figure. Only his materials are compatible with this figure. Kind of clever. Sometimes you want to say, hey, I want to search across my whole content library. I don't care if it's an accessory or if it's a wardrobe item. In that case, you can go to all products and then everything will be searched. So all those things, as I said, I'll just tell you everything and you go back to it. It'll be here when you need it. So let's go and put some wardrobe on here. I'll go to wardrobe, I'll go and uh, double click into my tactical assault outfit here. And this list looks a little bit overwhelming right now. Notice I'm on products here. That's the other thing I wanted to mention. This list looks a little bit overwhelming. It's almost like saying all files here. I'm looking at everything that is in this product. But if I wanted to apply that to a figure, I mean, which icon do I click for God's sake? There's like 400 million icons in here. I don't know what that means. And again, it's where smart content makes this really easy for you if you know how it works. So all files means it'll display all files that come with the product. If you select accessories, you will only see things that are accessories, which is the male and the female respirator. But those are just, you know, small things on the figure. They're not the whole outfit. So in case you needed this respirator on a different figure, you can go here to accessories and just have a look at that. I'll go and undo this. Materials will do the same thing. It'll show you all the materials that you can apply on objects. And wardrobe will show you all the wardrobe items that come with the product. But currently it shows you everything. So if you go and un if you, um, click this little uh, triangle icon here, you'll expand this and then you can filter things down. This is essentially like a filter. These are all files. These are only the accessories. These are only the materials. These are all the wardrobe items. But again, it's everything. You can click into armor and that'll show you all the armor pieces or only the gloves or only the pants or only the shirts. So that's how this works. This is how, once you understand that concept, it's really easy to find content and how to uh, kit bash things together as well. Like, you know, get the respirator from here, but get a dress out and maybe get a hair prop from somewhere else. And it's seriously cool. So 
Under outfits here, we have things that are called wearable presets. And they're things that let you apply a whole outfit made up of various bits and pieces onto one character. So in this case, we have three. It looks like we have a complete set of female, complete set of uh, female for night, and a complete set of female without the helmet. I'll go and use the first one here. Double click that with my figure selected. This is kind of an important lesson that we need to learn. If you have a figure selected and then you apply a clothing item, that studio will automatically fit it to the figure. Even if auto fit is necessary, if you have a clothing item from all the generations, then that studio needs to go through an auto fit process to make that work. And there we have it. That's my, my whole my outfit applied. And it contain, consists of various bits and pieces. So we have the glasses and the respirator and we have the jacket and we have, you know, whatever else here, gloves and face plates and stuff. So very interesting. They're now all no longer showing here in the scene tab. That's because they're parented. So these are all these items. Well, most of these items, there's others that are parented elsewhere and they are just cleaning up the scene tab here. Parented means uh, you have an object at the top of the hierarchy and whatever you parent it to it moves with it when you move the top object. There we go. Control Z will undo that. And we can try the second one. Different color scheme on this. And there we go. Same outfit, but with different material presets applied there. This is a very complex outfit, so... Um, you know, it's uh, it's some outfits are much, much simpler. They just have a shirt or they just have a dress or something or just a, just a skirt or some shoes. In this case, we have everything. But that's kind of cool for wearable presets. It's fairly time consuming to set this up one by one. So you could literally go ahead and go into the wardrobe and pick up your helmet and pick up the shirt. And, you know, so I could maybe go ahead and take this out with her selected. I can probably go and just apply the shoulder guards like this. That would work, but I'd have to go through this for every single object that makes up this um, this item. But the good thing about having it split up is if you wanted to use these shoulder pads with a different outfit, you can do that. So that's why Clothing Create has put that into place. Now, let me show you a slightly simpler outfit. Uh, I might even go back as far as the Genesis 8 basic starter essentials. And let's try the basic sports bra here on my Genesis figure. So notice if I double click that, it fits her immediately. It's parented here. If I were to move her, which we will do in a minute. In fact, that's a new, another tab I need for that to pose her properly. You see that the top moves with her. That's, that's nice. But if I undo this, and I don't have the figure selected. Sometimes when you bring in something, it won't be automatically fitted to the figure. And that's a shame. So in my case, it hasn't happened. So you see, this is not parented and that usually means it's not fitted. So as a result, if I have my figure here and I go and move her around, it oh looks like the sports bra is actually moving. So that's, that's nice. Often what happens is that this doesn't happen. And I just wanted to show you how to fix that manually, just in case this isn't, so it's not parented, but it's also fitted. Sometimes these things don't get fitted. If you right click on a clothing item, you have this fit basic wear sports bra two dialogue. And if you click that, you get another box that will show you what the conforming clothing item is supposed to be fitted to. If I set this to none, this is usually what happens when you load something in and I go and move my figure. And maybe you've seen this before. Then you'll see that the figure moves, but the clothing doesn't. And that's now because the, even if I parent my clothing to the figure, it's not fitted. So that's something, it looks like they've taken care of that. That's nice that that's now auto fitted, no matter if the figure is selected or not. So that's often confusing. Just wanted to make you aware of that. If something isn't fitted, you can just go and right click on the clothing item, either from here or from the scene tab use fit to uh, and then choose the figure that you want to fit it to genesis 8 female parent is optional that'll just make it disappear inside the figure when you do that you can go and select the figure move it around everything is fantastic that's essentially clothing in a nutshell so it'll be tricky if you have a figure 
whose for, for which the clothing wasn't made then you'll get all kinds of things like poke through there's also things when you apply pores and when you pose characters that sometimes clothing will poke through let me go and put the basic wear shorts on her as well there completing the outfit very nice there gives us something to wear Let's talk about posing in a little bit more uh, detail. Posing means that your character's limbs are being rotated in particular ways. So uh, just as a whoops, just as a as a as a quick guide or walkthrough of the figure, if you open her up or him up, then this here is the top node. That is kind of a container item, you can say. Then on the bottom, like further down here, you have the hip. And that selects kind of a different part of my figure. From here, we have the pelvis, and then we have the abdomen. And then, you know, there's there's other parts of the figure that come up here. Uh, chest lower, chest upper. Then there's the neck lower, neck upper. And eventually we have the head and so forth. And this these are technically bones that are set up in the figure that will move a portion of the geometry around. So not the whole geometry, but just a part of it. And they're all set up in this parent-child hierarchy so that when you move this part of your figure, everything that's parented below it will also move. Like as an example, if I go and click on this arm here and I move the arm up and down, the rest of the arm also moves up and down. So the hand and everything that's attached to the hand. Posing is kind of a, it's a deep topic. So anything that you adjust on any of these things can be saved as what's known as a pose preset. So you can sit here and make various adjustments with various tools and then save this as a pose preset and then apply it to a figure later. And this is what many of the pose creators have done. Uh, poses, they they uh, come with the, with the set that we're looking at here, which is the the icon set poses are under poses in the smart content with the figure selected we can have a look some are pose files these are all products that i'm looking at and if i drill into a product then i get to see the actual poses that are in there so for example the cdi vintage poses didn't we have one that came with the icons pose pack I thought we did. Maybe I haven't installed it. All sweet fashion poses from the NFP starter kit, for example. You load that in and you can see lots of male and female poses. So you can say by function and then you can say standing poses only. And then we have the uh, Genesis um, male and female poses. Let's pick a female pose. If I left, if I double click this, it'll be applied as a pose preset to my character and she strikes a pose. But this has basically been created by rotating every joint individually. And post presets are a great way to get your character started on, you know, on something that resembles a portrait. So I encourage you, if you get new products, play around with these and just see what comes with it. Usually they're filtered between uh, men and women. Some posing creators also give you mirrored versions. Others do not. So there are other tools that you can get if you... So this is a good example in which we have this version as well as that version. They're the same pose. It's just mirrored. One is left hand up, the other one is the right hand up. There are... If you're making your own poses and you would like that functionality, this is also included in the scene tools. I think in kit two, scene tools number two, that has a pose symmetry option that you can dock up here. And then you can just symmetrize any pose that you have. It being Genesis, you can actually apply male poses to female characters as well, which is nice. Often that works not so well and poses might need adjustments especially if you have characters that are not the base character so this works with the base character here i'm just looking at the hands here but sometimes you may have to make a uh, small adjustments and that is you either have to let's say let's just uh, in a concrete example if we use this pose and i had a character that is maybe the tomb princess here I was kind of hoping for somebody more rotund. Actually, this is going to work well. Here's a Rin. Rin's a good example where perhaps her arm is intersecting with her behind a little bit too much. And I need to go ahead and 
tweak some bits and pieces here. The hands may be a little bit close to the leg and stuff. So there's various ways of doing it. And I just wanted to show you uh, a couple of ways that I'll let you explore on your own, just so that we, you know, don't, don't lose too much time on it because I could go on forever. You know, the easiest thing I've shown you is uh, left click the limb that you want to change and go and tweak it. So I can go and use my universal manipulator and just go and rotate this any which way I see fit. The other option is to select it this way, but head over to the parameters tab and look at the transformations here. In the rotation field here, we'll see bend and twist. And those are things that I can do with this bone. And if I go and fiddle with those numeric parameters now, I can see that something's happening. And this is essentially the same thing that happened with my little slider that I had, um, that I had on there. And uh, twist is the same way. So they, these things will be called different things depending on what limb I select. Not everything can bend and twist. Like this here can bend and twist and it can also go forward and back, for example, the shoulder. So this is another way that you can adjust things. A third way is this little guy here. This is essentially the same red, green and blue sliders that you see here, just um, in a different in a different. Um, in a different display, if you will, this is twist. And then the green one is front and back. So you can hover and left click and drag. You can also even cooler, you can also use this little, um, this little trackball icon here. That takes a little bit of getting used to because one left click and depending on where you move your mouse, it'll affect all three axes of your arm. But you can see how powerful that is with a bit of skill. I encourage you to do it really nice and slowly and remember what happens in which direction. So it does take practice to do this, but you can move arms and hands and limbs and all kinds of things this way. That's kind of cool. That's how you pose things. And then my most absolutely super favorite tool is actually another pane that we need to open. It's called Power Pose. And that is essentially a combination of all these things with a bit of a intuitive twist if uh, if you allow me to say that so that is a palette that we can either grab from window panes power pose that'll bring it up you can also right click directly on any of these uh, empty bits and pieces here if i go and right click on this i can go and add a pane directly from here so power pose super exciting if i only could find it here there it is and then it gets docked there automatically so power pose is awesome because it has control points for the whole body. Let me go and zoom in on this so that you can see it better. Each of these points uh, selects a part of the body. And you can see that if I just move the character over here a little bit, if I go and select this part here, if I click on that, you can see that this part of the character is selected. And that's the, I suppose, the shoulder joint here. This is the collarbone joint. This is the collarbone joint on the other side. And this is something to have serious amounts of fun with because not only can you select these things, you can also use this to move things. So watch what happens if I go and uh, do the same thing that I did before, select this. Now I can go and it tells you at the bottom here, left click and drag front back. We'll move my arm this way. Seriously cool. I can also go and uh, left click and drag and move it up or down my mouse and then a different motion happens. It's a bit like that little trackball or I can use a combination and then literally just move my character around. Isn't that amazing? That is so cool to make small adjustments. If you practice, it's you're going to have too much fun with this. And this is what I use all the time to make quick pausing adjustments. I load in a pause preset that gets my character kind of halfway there and then I make fine adjustments with that. Really, really cool. But it really depends on the situation as well. So sometimes it's just easier to, you know, to make this uh, this change here. Now notice this is something else. I, I don't want to confuse you with too much stuff, but <laughs> if I do this, notice that all three sliders are changing values, even though I only fiddle with a single thing. And that might be confusing here because why would that happen? It's, uh, it doesn't make any sense. I'm just using one direction. I'm using just the red wheel, but red, green, and blue move. So what's going on there? This is seriously confusing. And again, this is a 3D application specific thing. The way my manipulator is facing right now, no matter which part of my body I select, 
and in fact which object I select is always that Y always points up and uh, the blue thing always points forward and the red thing always points to the right. And that is called the world orientation because that's just what my world looks like. Up is Y and that's green and then to the right is X and then forward is Z and that's just what it looks like. But if I look at it from the object's point of view, the object might have been rotated in 3D space. So it has a your pitch and roll applied and for the object forward might not be forward. Forward might now be top because I've kind of you know moved the object around or worse it's kind of twisted that the y-axis is now half forward and half to the side and half to the top and this is why all three values uh, move there. If you wanted to avoid that this is another tab that we need to know about it's called the tool settings tab super super important tab that I like docking over here and once again you can grab that by window panes tool settings context sensitive little thing that will let me adjust the properties of my tool that I'm using. So currently that's the 3D manipulator. If I go and grab that, either make it floating, I'll go, I'll go dock it over here. Then with my 3D manipulator selected, or in fact any of the other guys here selected, I can see that my world coordinates are displayed as, well, world coordinates. I can change this to local coordinates. And these are things that you might be switching between all the time just to set up pro objects properly. And this is just so important to remember because if I look at my 3D manipulator now and I switch over to local coordinates, watch what happens. It changes position. Do you see that? This was world. And no matter where I put this, green always points up. But now when I go and switch this to local coordinates, green is now pointing a completely different way. And this is important because every single bone of the body uh, will have its own transformations applied. And now when I go and go back to the parameters tab and I go fiddle with one slider, you'll see that only one slider should be moving. Dang, it's not the case. <laughs> Demonstration effect. Okay, let me try something else. Yeah, only one thing should be moving like this. This is kind of what I'm expecting. So very important to remember, if you're trying to move something and you're thinking, hey, uh, I'd like to shift something into a different position and it doesn't quite work, use the tool settings tab and go switch from one to the other. There's also object coordinations, screen coordinates and uh, world coordinations with local rotation. So try all these things out. If the, if the manipulator doesn't behave the way you feel it should, then this is probably uh, something you should look into. I'll switch it back to world coordinates because that's kind of what we what we uh, what we need for objects right now. And let's move on. So yeah, power pose super exciting tool for me to make uh, adjustments. Just to bring this uh, to a close, you've got two types of little dots here. You've got the solid ones; those are for a particular joint. But you also have the ones that have a tiny little star on the outside here. And if you click on, so if you click on one of these, left click and drag, then only that one joint moves. But if you go and left click and drag on any of the, of the star shaped ones, then multiple joints move together as a group. Like in this case, it'll be, hang on, it'll be bending forward. So this is not just one joint that moves, but multiple. So works left and right as well. You can almost animate it this way. Isn't that cool? That is just so cool. So if you're dialing in poses and you're roughing it out or if you're adjusting things, this is this is the way to do it. Power Pose also has an option for the heads and the hands. So if we go and look at the at the hand here, you can right click and go and select the right hand. Control F will zoom in on that. You can click on these little hands here and that will now show you the same setup for hands and uh, once again this is uh, this is that hand this here is the whole group of the hand so she can make a fist but she can also move her individual fingers or the individual pieces of the finger so just super exciting I, I love this tool and you have the same for the head
which even lets you pull in basic, uh, basic, oops, let me go select this guy so that the manipulator goes out of the way here. You can use the eyes up and down. You can do a combination of that. And you can also go and let, let the eyebrows speak for themselves. You can do Mr. Spock here. That's illogical, Captain. And then you can also go uh, do things with the nose. You can dial in some expression, some grumpiness here. You can go and play with the mouth. May give a pouty face. You can play with the with the sides of the mouth. So this is how this is a great way of visually adjusting things. And then of course you can also turn the head. So all of that with the power pulse templates, they're free, of course. Uh, you just need to install them. So in order to use this, go and uh, uh, search for power pose in your install manager and then you will get this so if this doesn't show up with the figure selected then it's probably because uh, power pose templates are not installed but they're available and you know it's, it's um it's something i i definitely recommend so let's go and uh, maybe start afresh and browse through some more bits and pieces that let us uh that let us make a portrait with this. We could probably start with this. I think we can maybe just uh, just just keep using this and just keep keep rocking rocking away there. Uh, expressions are another thing that that is uh, that's important to me. We'll probably change the outfit and the skin in a minute, but perhaps we're going to stay with this pose and just frame her up, just so that we have a bit of a starting point, maybe. Now, I've previously said maybe camera is a good idea. Let's do camera next that we have a shot that we've got locked in because this is another important thing that I want to uh, that I want you to take away from this. If this is something that's framed up nicely and I were to save my scene and then go, which I might actually do <laughs> right now, if I save my scene and close that studio down and bring it back tomorrow or later today, I'll find that this shot is gone and that's not good. If I've spent hours stream test, if I've spent hours, I'll just call it, uh, I'm going to call it a portrait, stream portrait. How about that? Yeah. If I've spent hours framing up this shot and I'm really happy about it, uh, I need to create a camera so that these coordinates of me looking at her are being saved and that's really important that brings us to this really important part about cameras have settings that the viewport does not or that the viewport doesn't expose so what you do with your dream configuration framed up you can head over to create new camera up here and that will create a camera that will be able to save these things so if i do this little dialog comes up often usually by default this is collapsed and it's important to understand what Das Studio is trying to tell you here. If you click on this here, show options, you can give it a name. I'll just leave mine on camera. But down here it says the options that we have. Apply default settings, copy active view, which is the perspective view, which is whatever I've set up on my perspective view. And then there's also apply active viewport transforms for the perspective view. I'm going to go to this one here copy active view and that will now create a camera that looks at exactly the same thing as my perspective view looks so as a result i can now go and move out go look at my character from different angles and still have a camera object in my scene that is now going to have stored whatever i've set up there so i can go and change to the camera with this thing here where it says perspective view i can go over to camera and this is now what i had uh, what I had framed up there, which is kind of cool. Control S to just you know, save that in. And that could be my shot. There's more to this that we need to set up in the render settings. And I'll show you more about this. I'm sure we have time for that. But um, before I glance over, that's it for cameras. There's, there's so much else that we can do with cameras. So let me let me impress upon you the importance of the focal length. The perspective view has a certain focal length. I think it's about 65 millimeters in, in DAS terms, but that's not a great focal length to shoot portraits off. You probably notice this when somebody's taken a portrait with their phone and they were kind of right in your face and took a picture of you. 
it looks okay because there's some artificial undistortion going on. But if you were to do this with a regular lens and the distortion would still be on there, you'll see that your nose is big and the kind of the sides of your head look a bit slim and you don't look your best. But when you look at the fashion magazines, all the, por all the portraits of the fashion models, they look awesome. So why is that? It's maybe they're not taking it with a phone. That could be one thing. But the other thing is that they're using a different focal length. So I'm going to go and with my camera select, I'm going to make another camera. I'm going to go and create a new camera and I'm going to go and select copy view camera, which now means I have two cameras which look exactly the same. That's that's nice. I'm going to set camera two up differently to camera one so that we have a comparison here. I might even go and set up another camera. In fact, just to show you this, that I have three cameras here and they all look exactly the same. So the first camera, I'm going to go over here to the parameters tab and I go to the camera tab and I'll have a look at the focal length, which is in fact set to 65 millimeters. Let me do, so let me set this to 28 and you'll see what happens visually in the viewport. It looks like we frame up more. So we see more than we actually want to see. Well, that's okay. I can just go and dolly forward so that I see the same person on the same portion exposed. But what I've really done now is I've changed the focal length and thereby um, compressing the perspective a bit more. And I'm going closer to the object, which is the same as your friend taking a picture of you right in your face. Now, if I switch between camera one and camera two, I can see that the, the figure looks very different. So this looks kind of okay on camera two, which is the original. Uh, camera one is now the wider, wider shot that I'm very close in with the camera. And that doesn't look so flattering. I mean, it kind of depends on the portrait that I want to take, but I suppose for her, she looks better this way than she does this way, right? Let me go and show you something else. If I go to camera three now, if we leave camera two alone and I'll select camera three and I'll go and do the opposite. So instead of going down in the focal length, I will go up in the focal length and we'll show something like, I'll say 120, just for argument's sake. I can probably put 200, anything, anything goes, whatever you feel comfortable with. Portrait photographers use something between that, between 100 and 200 millimeters. So maybe I'll, I'll say 150. But now, of course, I'm kind of I'm zoomed in right too much into a face so I can go and zoom out a bit or dolly out a bit while being zoomed in. And those proportions now look very different as well. So if I go and switch between these cameras, I have kind of alien distortion, kind of something that works ish and something that may or may not look much flat, much more flattering as a portrait. So take that into consideration when you frame up your PFPs and make sure you make them look the best. All of these have value and it really depends on what you'd what you'd like to portray. So sometimes this perspective here is kind of exactly what we want, something even more distorted perhaps. Uh, but usually if you have a flattering portrait of a pretty lady, you probably go with something like this. The middle one here, this one, that's the default uh, focal length that the perspective view has. And you can use it as a good starting point, but it really does give your, your portrait some, you know, different features if you do make that a bit longer. There's also lighting considerations. If I had uh, light objects set up, you can see like here, I see part of a shoulder that I did not see in the other version or in, in this version here. It's all very different here. So as, as soon as I add lighting effects, I do see uh, like a highlight or like a catch light would be more pronounced on a longer focal length than it would be on a shorter one. Just something to be aware of. So let's use camera three for now and just use make these cameras um, invisible so that we don't see the overlays there. Yeah, so Absolutely. I'm kind of rocking through this here just so that uh, know that this is going to be available later and, you know, for you to dissect and take snippets out and go back to. And also, if you're watching this on the recording and I'm going too fast or I'm going too slow, have a look at that little gear icon that lets you increase or decrease the playback speed. Kind of nice. Oh, yeah. One other thing I wanted to show you where our cameras are. 
in relation to our figure. This one's the iPhone close in your face. This one's kind of medium. This one's further away. And if you've watched fashion photographers at work, they have these really long lenses and they're far away from their models and they need to shout to ask them to uh, put a different pose on. That's why, because they're, sh they're using a longer focal length to, to shoot their models. So we'll use camera three and we'll go and uh, use the other ones. You know, don't, don't worry about the other ones. Let me quickly finish off the camera thing. You can see this little gray box here. That is the camera frame as such. If we switch back uh, over to the camera, we can see that that's kind of framed up, but this isn't exactly a square. So if I go and just open up another tab, you can see I have kind of a very rectangular viewport here. How do I know what's framed up in my final picture? I mean, is this all going to render? How do I set my render dimensions? What happens if I wanted to uh, render a square picture versus a 16 by 9 versus a portrait picture? How do I do that? And how do I even get, uh, how, do I, how do I get a visual representation of what my framing is? Especially given that I could change viewport sizes and what happens, how does that relate to the camera? I'm glad you asked. Well, you haven't, but I'm telling you because that is all under the render settings. So the render settings tab, luckily we've left it open at the top here under general has the pixel size, the global pixel size that lets you set the render dimensions in pixels. It also has aspect ratios at the top here that you can choose from. So if I were to use active viewport, then anything that's in the viewport will be rendered. So literally from this corner here to this corner here, to that corner there, to that corner there, depending on the actual size of that viewport on the screen, these dimensions will change. Currently they are, in my case, 964 by 927. So not quite a square, but almost a square. If I pick something from this list here, say a square, then it will tell me what well, currently that'll be just adjusted to 964 by 964. I can also set this to something else. I could say like, you know, 2000 by 2000. And that's now a square, but in order to see this visually represented in my viewport, I can go up here in this little hamburger icon and select show aspect frame. I believe I've switched that off earlier, but that's that white little, um, thing here. And up here, it shows me what the aspect ratio of this is. So currently one by one. But if I wanted to have this to be a portrait, for example, I can go down here and say, I might make this, this could be a panorama, or it could be a photo, or it could be 16 millimeter, uh, whatever. Maybe there's a, there's a glow, what, what's it called again? There's a golden aspect ratio here. One by 1 to 1.61803. And that's available in landscape and portrait. If I switch this to portrait, then I get this. If I switch this to landscape, oops, I get that. And I can now go ahead and literally frame up the portion of my scene that I like independently from the resolution. So if this is the aspect ratio that I'm interested in, I can now go and overwrite this resolution here. Let's say if we stick with the portrait, for example, and I say, this is, this is great. This is my framing. Now I probably go, you know, slightly off center. I'd also probably make it a bit wider. I'm, I'm kind of a three by two man. If I'm, if I'm working with portraits, but now I can go and overwrite this. I can, I can say, Hey, I'd like for this to be 1200 wide and whatever that is in height, go calculate it for me. 1942. And now this is the amount of pixels that will be rendered versus the thing that would like a visual representation of what my what my image is going to come out as. So if I hit Control R or click the render button, this is what I'll see now. I think for a profile picture, let's go and make this square and then give it something like 1200 by 1200 is good because that's kind of, you know, profile pictures are square and we're going to go and render this, this out like that. So this is our camera locked in and say this is now the framing I'd like to use. Maybe I want to go in a little bit further. Actually, no, I'm, I'm good with this. We're going to use hair and whatnot, so that's going to be good. If I wanted to accessorize my character now, go switch back over to my perspective view and I can go and run around again and look at my character from all sides without 
doing anything nasty to my framing. So that's still in, in the right position. So make sure you don't change that. If you're happy with the shot, go back to the perspective view and then go and accessorize your character. So in our case, let's see what happens if we go and put some sunglasses on. And perhaps we don't really want that, that basic underwear. We might want something else, maybe a dress or something. So let's go and remove it. You remember how to do this? Right click either on the, on the item and select the sports bra, then go delete to delete it. Or you can go and right click on it and just go delete the basic wear sports bra. You can do that as well. Remember navigating without these tools, control and alt while left clicking and dragging in the viewport. Panning, control and alt and right clicking. Mouse button scrolling forward and back to zoom in and out. Control F to zoom in on the item that you've got selected. Double click the figure to select the whole figure. Control F, then, you know, that happens. S single click something to hone in on one particular part. Double click the figure and then they'll select the, the top node there if ever you needed that. So delete the basic wear shorts, select our Genesis character and see what we find in our clothing library here. Now that we're happy with the pose, Let's go to wardrobe and see what's available. This is a cool outfit here. Tactical outfit we've had a look at. There's also the multi-dress system for Genesis. That's a fairly complex system. I might leave that for another day. I'll go and use something that is uh, fairly simple to apply. Maybe Deforce Gothic Punk outfit. How's that? That's kind of cool. Here we have... Um, less clothing items. Uh, but like I said before, under wardrobe, we have this here. That's a wearable preset. That's essentially everything. That's for, um, that's everything, including the gloves and the shoes. This one is just the dress without the gloves or the shoes. And then I suppose we also have uh, accessories like the glasses. So um, that's kind of depending on the clothing item, uh, what you have. I might just use the dress because we're not going to frame up the the hands so we don't necessarily need gloves there i suppose they're on there that's cool if something is not in vision don't bother fixing it so we know we're going to look at her face like this so that means if she's wearing shoes or not or if her dress doesn't doesn't work further down we're not really all that bothered about it because we're not framing that up so there's another 3d creator trick only frame up what you actually what you actually see in the render later very important so so super important w4n you can lock your camera yes absolutely and i, I strongly recommend you do that because more than often, I was on the camera, changing it around. I've covered how to do that in a previous um, live stream. So with that on, let's go to accessories and give her these extremely cool punk glasses. Look at that. That is that is very cool. So they are, it looks like I've got this kind of anime head here. So I've got my glasses kind of sink into the head. That's not something I'm particularly keen on. So we can have a look if that is adjustable. And this is really something that is... Whoops. Oh, come on. That uh, it depends on the, on the item that you're trying to fit. So uh, some things might not fit with your characters, and that's when adjustment morphs uh, come in. Select the glasses. Head over to the parameters tab and see what we have here. So under Actor, you have an Adjustments tab. And good products have a lot of them. Uh, some products don't have any. And uh, I, it's one of those things you never know what you get. Usually the sales page tells you what morphs there are. So this one is a particularly uh, good one, it seems, because I can go and uh, just literally play around with them and see what they do. Rotation side side. So this is something to adjust the glasses here, I guess. There's rotation up and down. If it intersects with the nose, this is what you could do. Stretch terminals front back. Almost what we need. We're not quite seeing it yet. Terminal stretch side to side. That's doing something, but it's not what we need. And then there is uh, up and down. That's also not what we need. Translate front back. 
kind of doing something. Okay, translate side side. I can't remember. And translate up down. Uh, that's a shame. It looks like it's not going to work with our head unless I bring it into a 3D content manipulation program like Hexagon or Blender or ZBrush. Then I can literally touch the geometry and move it outwards. There's also projects, the, the products like the Mesh Grabber that might be able to help you with this. There's also um, things like Deformers in Dash Studio that will that have a limited influence on geometry that lets you deform it a little bit. But sadly, that's outside the scope of this uh, bootcamp. So let's go and pick different glasses because I do like some glasses. Thankfully, we have other glasses in our... Oops. Huh. See, this happens to me all the time. We have other glasses in the in the icons product. Oops. Head, control F to do that. And one of them is, of course, the alt sunglasses, I believe it's called. And that would probably be under the accessories here. There it is, alt style glasses. These are great. That's a staff pick uh, for, for good reason. So they're different models of glasses here. This is, comes with this Icons product, so very, very cool. And I'll just start with the first one here. With my figure selected, uh, double click the accessory to apply it. And I can see it's kind of on there somehow, but it's also shifted into the head. So I think maybe the head shape is just something that works against us here, which is cool. We can change that later. But uh, these glasses also have various adjustment options. So select under adjustments. I've got the size here. There's the male adjustment but it's just not working for my uh, for my for my head shape so sometimes we just need to make artistic compromises so uh, luckily i can just go and use something else i'll go back to my genesis figure and just shape her head size to fit my glasses because i really want to use them so under the parameters tab and again this is also available under the shaping tab but i like the idea of having everything in one in one place here that's under uh, actor and I have head and then I have real world and uh, and people and if I can't quite find what is actually dialed in because I have so many head morphs I can use this selection here again this is all these dials all these sliders that can be filtered either with a search uh, option here if I'm looking for something particular toenails or you know eye size or whatever I can type that in here and it'll show me where that is or I can say what's currently used so that's also important if I select that then I see every slider that is currently used and I can see that I'm using my RIN body and my RIN head and many of the other bits and pieces that I've dialed in here so maybe RIN head wasn't working in my favor so I'll go and left click and drag this and there's my anime head goes back to where it was. So yeah, these glasses, typically I would go, if I wanted to use them on an anime style head, I'd go and take them into ZBrush or into Blender and then just fiddle with it or into Hexagon. Um, and I think, did I explain this in a previous video? I'm sure I have. But for now, I'm going to go and dial the RIN head out. I'm kind of, am I maybe not too attached to the RIN uh, body either? I'm just going to go and move the RIN body back and see what other body types we have, or in fact, what other characters we have. It's kind of also part of building a building a portrait. Maybe I'll go over to figures and have a look. Toon, Princess, we're gonna have the same problem with. Victoria, also good. Ico is probably also a bit, uh, could have a little bit of an anime uh, head there. But let me see what happens. If I go and select my Genesis figure here and I go and click on Ico now, watch what happens. So I'll double click and that studio is clever enough to say, hey, I've noticed there's a Genesis 8 figure in your scene already. What would you like to do? Would you like me to load in a second figure? Maybe you want to build something with two characters. Or would you like to apply the settings that make up Ico, like I've explained earlier? Would you like me to load this into the current figure because it seems to be compatible? And you've got these two choices. So load in a new figure would give you a second character. And apply first character to the currently selected figure means I do that and wait a second and then both the Ico skin as well as the Ico body morphs will load and you know show up there after a substantial wait period. Ta-da! Perfect! So Ico looks cool. 
and her glasses look almost like they don't need adjustment, so the head width is, uh, is pretty good. I also like the size of the glasses here. That's neat. If this is a bit too blown out, the easiest thing to do is just go switch over to Texture Shaded. And it's a very different way of looking at it. So maybe I like the, the glasses, but maybe they're a bit too big. So I can go and right click and select the glasses under Parameters. Let me go open this. Under Adjustments, I have Glasses Size, so that makes the whole glasses a little bit smaller. That might be might be good for me. And then there's also the male adjustment. Oh, now they're digging into the head, so maybe 100% is, is not what I should be doing. Maybe that. Also switch over to your universal manipulator. I had switched over to just the selection tool to not see the manipulator. And let me go and select that and just bring the these arms up a little bit. So just left click and drag just a tiny amount somehow it's not really going to work with rotation maybe i need to go and lift them up a bit or do you know what ideally really a quick adjustment in in a 3d tool or we're not going to worry about it that's also possible depending are we going to see this or not i think these glasses are actually rigged so i can go and uh, select part of it this is not happening on all glasses, but I think, look at that, I can actually go and move this around. If I don't have enough control with my slider here, uh, you can go to, to your parameters tab and then just go and adjust that here until you're absolutely happy like now. Side by side, and I suppose that happens here as well. Right click that arm here left and then go adjust side by side here and these things they'll very much depend on what uh, what item you're uh, you're using what what um, what accessory what clothing item yeah so the, the the glasses don't quite fit on her nose I don't think so if I'd be really pernickety I'd probably fiddle with this for another half hour or so but I don't think we have the time, so let's just go leave it as it is and say that's that's what I want to use. Let's also say, before we put some hair on, I'd like for her to look, to have a bit of a different expression. Let's talk about expressions just briefly, because they really make or break a character. And they are available also as additional dials, once again from the Parameters tab, and they're in the figure's head. And nowadays we have... Um, Alias is set up that means if you have the top level of the figure selected under pose controls, under head, you will find expressions over here. And depending on the products you've got installed, you've got more or less sliders here. I think the base Genesis figures, they come with about six or so expressions. And if you go and left click and drag any of these sliders, you can see that, you know, the expression of the character changes. Angry, or, you know, bereft, or bored, or whatnot. But the Icons bundle is cool because it contains so many additional sliders. So that's, I think, why we picked this, because it's just, if you're getting started with this and you really want more control over the, over the expressions you have, and look into buying that, it's a really good uh, starter kit. Sometimes you might think, hey, this is... This is nice, but I'd like a bit of a stronger expression. So if I stay with, if I stay with one of them on the top here, say afraid, that's a little bit scared, but it's not like super afraid, right? And if I wanted that to be more afraid, you can go and override the percentage on the slider. So by default, these are set up to be zero to 100% affairs but if you wanted something like 500 percent or you wanted to be something really afraid this might distort so avert your eyes there children you can go and click this little gear icon on every slider has that and all these sliders kind of work the same so it doesn't matter if it's an expression slider or post slider if there's anything that you want to override you can do that so click that slider head over to parameter settings and then in this case 
don't be scared of all these options as i said i'm just mentioning it because it's there you'll get you got used to it you can either disable the limits which means there's no more limit after 100 percent. you can crank this up to whatever or you can leave the limits and say well I 10,000% is probably going to look scary, but maybe we're going to get away with 300% or say 500%. You can set that up. And now this slider's range is much larger. So now 100% is here. But if I go and uh, crank this up now to the right, watch what happens to the expression. It's basically like extremely afraid. So 500 might be a bit too much, but if you wanted that kind of expression, you can make that happen. But, you know, just dial it up to whatever value feels right for you so maybe you know we get away with 130 140 that's more than the slider was was previously able to give you and when you save the scene this this is what's being saved as well so expressions as i said there's so many of them maybe i like flirting maybe i like frowning maybe i like her to be i don't know ill hd maybe I'd like a combination of all of them. How do I do that? You can do that. You can just go and crank up happy a little bit and maybe also put a little bit of fear into it. And then, you know, you have you have two sliders that you've dialed up. They override one another or they, 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 they blend in with one another. This is just like uh, figure shapes. They're all deltas that, set, that are set up that move vertices on the same base object around. So you can literally dial in all of them, but... Uh, if you find the figure distorts beyond belief, that is, of course, what happens. So be a little bit careful with that. Uh, but yes, essentially, all these sliders can be dialed in as much or as little as you like until you find that perfect expression. What I like doing, and this is another one of those things that's just absolutely amazing about Das Studio, is to throw a few of them onto the puppeteer space and then blend in between them until I'm happy with the expression that I'd like to use for a portrait. And puppeteer is one of those things, it's a 2D blend space. It's essentially an animation space that can blend multiple sliders together and Das Studio uses this under the hood and Puppeteer is its way of exposing that. It's a beautiful thing. It requires another pane. It's just something else to look at under window panes Puppeteer. This is the one. So Puppeteer is the is the thing that's just so cool for you. Enable that. I usually dock it over on the right hand side. This is an empty gray space and it allows us to be in edit mode or in preview mode. You can even record as you move between things. Let me show you how it works. So currently she doesn't have any expressions. So I'll just go in edit mode. I'll just go and click on this space. I do nothing else. Now I go ahead and dial up an expression, maybe like, you know, afraid, like 200%. Let's, let's use 200%. And I go and click anywhere else, like maybe here, and now I have two points. That's kind of cool. Now let me go switch over to preview here. Very important. And then these two dots will become white. And that means now I can go left click and drag anywhere here and blend from here all the way over to here. And I can pick something in between. And that is kind of cool already. I mean, I could do that because this is literally just dialing up this slider. So this is not really that big a deal. What is that big a deal is if I go back into edit mode and I pick up something else, like maybe I'll pick up drunk and put another dot on my space. And maybe after drunk, I'm going to go and put fear HD, the fear of God into her and put that here. And then I go into preview mode. I can now go ahead and preview between all these things. And if I do that fast enough, I can even make it appear as if she's talking. Most importantly, I'll be able to blend in and give my, give the one expression that I'm really happy with. I think you can also, oops, you can also move this if you're running out of space and you like to move beyond a slider's value, you can do that. This is this is basically, if we're looking at this one here, this is that guy, 0%, 100%. This would be here like 200%. So it exaggerates this movement as you go beyond it. Usually you set up something like an emotion wheel, the neutral in the center, and then you have various expressions on the outside. And then you just drag your slider into whatever you want the figure to look like. And you set this up once for your perfect character. And then you can render sequential portraits for this, no problem at all. So maybe, you know, maybe she's, maybe she's miffed like this. I think that's kind of a cool expression. 
Let's leave it. That's our expression done with puppeteer. Let me go and save it. So this will work for body shapes as well. If you're not sure which body shape you want to go, throw a few of these onto the puppeteer tab. Uh, you know, Michael, sorry, Michael and maybe George and maybe, you know, other people just, just throw them all around and blend in between them and see what you come up with. The most beautiful body or facial shapes. Puppeteer also has layers. So if you want to uh, layer an expression over a head shape. You can do that as well. I might de dedicate a whole stream just to Puppeteer because it's just so, so wonderful. Deal breaker, absolutely. Oh, duplicate formula. Oh, that's what you mean, right? Yes, that is something, I gotta be brutally honest, I haven't encountered that except for a single time. In all my years of working with Das Studio, I know that many people have this issue a lot. But I've actually never had a problem with it. But it's probably also because most of my content is from the DAS store rather than from other marketplaces, which I think they have different quality controls. And um, so, yeah, as I said, it's just, it's just not, it's a phenomenon that I'm familiar with. But in 16 years of working with DAS Studio, I've had it once, and that was because I made a mistake. So it's one of those things. It's, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's tricky to get to, to the bottom of what causes it and whose fault it what. So it's, you know. Righty, we've got this. We have... Oh, my night mode just went on. Thank you for telling me this. My producer just came in. Let me just go and switch that off. Uh, night light off. Ding! There we go. We're back on day mode. The, the light, the light. Yes, it is six o'clock. Maybe that was my, my subtle reminder. Thank you, Pamela. That is my subtle reminder to say, wrap it up, Jay. This, this was two hours. That's it, workshop over. We've gone through half of what I wanted to tell you. Not quite half. We're going to wrap this up in the next half hour, 45 minutes. We've got our expression. We've got our character. It's kind of looking good. Let's put some hair on it and see what she looks like when we render her. So again, with the Genesis figure selected on my Smart Content tab, let me go browse to hair. It has its own category. All the hair that is compatible is on here. Could be the messy pixie cut. Coon hair, Roxy hair, Vanessa hair. There's so many different hairs. Voss hair is one of my favorites. There's also, which is the one that came with our bundle? I'd love to try that out. Where is it? Oh, this one here. There it is. <laughs> Classic side part hair. Let's do that. Some hair props, they work for Genesis 3 as well as 8. They work for males and females. This is one such product, so that's kind of cool. But you've got to be aware of what you're selecting here. So it says a G3F, that's Genesis 3 female. This one's Genesis 3 male. This one is also Genesis 3 male. This one here is Genesis 8 female. Classic side part hair. So I'm going to use that. Double click it and just see what it looks like. Hair is a whole different thing altogether. Uh, hair has a lot of adjustments usually. Hair also has a lot of uh, colors that you can use. Neat. So to get a better view of what this is going to look like. I'm, oh, there we go. It's now settled. So it's a bit of a fitting process that's that's going on there. We're going to have to really see uh, what the colors look like in uh, in the iRay render. Notice that hair usually takes the longest to render because there's a lot of transparency going on and all that. So it's, uh, it's one of those things. Uh, shaping is usually a way for you to shape the hair. So we can play with that. I might just leave it on the default, but you know, with the hair selected, this is how you do this. Uh, select the hair and then go and, and apply one of these. Usually there's also um, dials that dial these things in. So it's a matter of playing with it, seeing what it's doing, and seeing if you like it for the particular portrait you're making. Or maybe this is nice. I like that. That's cool. And not only that, there's also then, of course, the materials. So um, once again, we drill down into iRay because we want to use iRay. And there's all kinds of things like um, platinum blonde, and then some people give you like pink and purple and all that. I'm thinking maybe since we have a darkish outfit, let's go with, with, the, with the black hair. And let's go and see what this looks like in iRay. This is going to take a second. And this means we're, once we've seen that, we're going to have to make some different adjustments. This is with the base lighting. Often there's something that you might encounter with hair. I don't know if this is 
one of them. There's often a little transparency issue and I currently don't see it. That doesn't mean it's not there. I've covered that in the last uh, DAS live stream in which you can adjust the hair transparency a little bit to avoid that problem. I think it's kind of cool. That's just something I've noticed. And when I'm using, when I'm moving my iRay viewport, it's my computer is really struggling with this. And there is a way to minimize that. And this is on one of the tabs we've sadly, we've closed earlier. <laughs> Let me bring that back, right click over here and go under draw settings. With the iRay viewport selected, there's under uh, general. Is it general? No, it's not. It's drawing. It's optimization actually. Where was it? There's a way for uh, iRay to say, hey, don't render the full uh, viewport. Render me, uh, render me something else. I just forgot where that is. Manipulation resolution, a quarter. So you can set this to something lower. There we go, it's under drawing, draw resolution. If I set this to a 16th, I think my computer is probably gonna be a little bit more happy with that. Oh, also, am I using both my GPUs? Under render settings, advanced. Yes, I am, okay. We'll come back to render settings in a moment. I just wanted to see if that does anything. No, it looks like it's not not quite doing what I had hoped. Usually this lets my, my viewport manipulate itself a little bit faster than it currently does. It's one of those things. I've just installed my operating system again on a brand new computer, so the settings aren't quite there yet as I'm, as I'm used to it. Let me look through my camera. Oh, that's actually the wrong one. No, that was the right one, wasn't it? There we go, camera. I'm gonna zoom in a bit more because I'd like to focus in on her face here for a profile picture like this. So I'm, say I'm, I'm happy with what the expression looks like, what the, what the character looks like. I might wanna go and accessorize things. I'd like to put earrings on, maybe a necklace, something like that, maybe even a mustache. You know, um, that's, that's something that you can try out. Um, different skin variations, you can try all that out. I might go and, uh, and just go and um, do that in a moment. But right now, just to, just to get a feel for what the portrait could look like. This looks fairly bland and it doesn't look it doesn't look like something I'd, I'd like to render out and share with people. I'd like to say, hey, there's there's something missing here. And that is a bit of pizzazz, a bit of good lighting. So the way lighting currently is applied is by something called HDRI. And that's uh, that's the abbreviation for high dynamic range image. And that is essentially a sphere that's on the outside of our scene. It's kind of invisible right now. On the inside of which we have projected an image. And it's usually a spherical image that's been taken out in the real world or constructed with 3D tools or even with 2D tools. And the light parts of the inside of that sphere shine light onto the center of our scene. And that's what gives us kind of a diffuse light. Usually you have one or two light spots and the rest of the image is kind of flat and gray. In fact, let me show you this under render settings under environment, we have this thing here, which is the environment map. And that is in fact the HDRI that DAS Studio applies by default. And it looks like, you know, it's called ruins and it's a very low resolution image and it's just there to emulate outdoor sunlight. And it's really not meant to be, you know, something that's, that's supposed to look great, but this, imagine that projected on the inside of a large sphere that's around our scene, that's shining in, that gives us the, that gives us essentially the light. So there's not just one light that we'd get with one light source in a black room. There's more light going on. There's diffuse light, there's bounced light. So we have one bright spot in the middle there, which is probably the sun, which is behind some clouds, but we also have shadows and that gives us a very natural experience. But it's not something, it's not the look I'd like to go for. So I like, uh, I like to start with a one-click render product usually and see where that gets me. And the ones I recommend you look into are the ones by the wonderful, the one and only Cake One. She is a professional promo render artist who works for DAS and many of the pictures that you've seen on promo images are by her. She has a wide range of products in the store and uh, some of them are called click and render. And that's exactly what they're there for, click and render. And trust me when I say I've tried out so many 
one-click lighting products over the years. And I, as I said, I've been doing this for 16 years and they all they were all kind of lacking in something that, you know, it wasn't quite it wasn't quite what I liked. So I usually set up my own lights, but click and render really makes it super easy for you not to learn lighting and get started with something that looks cool. Let me show you around me. I've got two of them here. This one is the click and render IBL set and the other one is the pop edition. So what you do, first of all, they're under render settings in the smart content tab. These two are $4.99 for Platinum Club members or DAS Plus members. So, you know, have a look at that. Thank you, Brian, for posting those links. So these are all the render presets you get. And each of them, if you hover over them, you get a bit of a uh, look of what this light set is going to do. Like maybe I like this one. So double click it and that's going to apply render settings and a different HDRI and it completely changes the look and feel of my portrait. And maybe I don't like that. So I'm going to go further and just I'm just going to try a few and see what I like. Look, we've got a light from a different direction here. These are all HDRIs. The light spot comes from different directions and really depending on what you'd like your product or what you like your portrait to look like. Try a few different ones and see which ones you fancy. I'm just trying very carefully to move her up a little bit without cutting off too much of the hair. And this is a good starting point. Just go through a few and see which character of the lighting resonates with you. And if you like this, great. Like what I've shown you in the time lapse in the beginning, I can now go and set up maybe another light. So we've got a, like a pink light that uh, creates a bit of a catch light here. If it's a bit too strong, no problem. You go over to the render settings tab and then whoops, <laughs> don't double click it. And then you turn down the environment intensity. So I'll do it extreme like 0.5. And then that's going to be half as bright as it was before. Or you can also use, uh, if I put this to back to one, you can change the strength of the environment map. That's also possible. You can also increase the value. If, if that's not quite bright enough for you, you can leave it to five and then it really blows out things. It kind of depends on the skin complexion of the, of the character. Once again, alt click on any of these sliders if you've made adjustments and that'll bring it back to the default value. Maybe I'll go with 0.8 because that just uh, takes that blown out character on her skin off a little bit, but it entirely depends on, you know, what's what's happening here. So let's say I kind of like this. And in fact, I mean, I could show you, I could show you some of the, the light settings on the click and render pop edition. There's also a pastel edition. This is what the guys use that render these portraits on the NFP collection there. If you do that, you have a funky, super colorful background there. And maybe this is what you like. Maybe you need something in blue. It just really gets you started. And uh, that's not to say you shouldn't learn lighting. No, absolutely you should. But to quickly browse through some options this this is for me this is a this is a game changer and i really like these products she has others so if you're into this approach of lighting go and treat yourself tonight i'm gonna go with this one here because i think i like the the purple the uh, hue i got here from it was it this one or was it this one this one got me a dramatic light from oh no that's not going to work for me yeah, you can also rotate HDRI. So there's a lot that you can learn from it. But to get started, these are ideal things you, you can go you can go with. Ah, how do you stop, um, Casey? Good question. How do you stop uh, loading that default HDRI in there? So what I've done. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll talk about this maybe now. Let's talk about this now. Um, you can set up something like a different HDRI in render settings, like what I have, right? And imagine I didn't have a character in here. I could just go and uh, delete my character out. I won't do it now, but uh, you, you know what I mean. You just, you just take out everything, set up your render settings as the defaults that you'd like. In fact, set up a scene that you like to have as a default. Like what I do is I don't like the default settings for the filament draw options because they're, they're too blown out. So what I do is I create myself a filament draw options node, and then I select it in the scene and under parameters, I go and dim this down so that you know it's 
it's more something that that looks closer to more IRA preview. I mean, it's not it's not there 100. percent I need to set this up properly. There's also the scene lights that you can that you can film it if if you had scene lights. We don't, but if we had, so you know, the default I think is like this, which is unusable for me. So I go and turn this down to something that's you know more to my liking. And once I have that, and you can do the same for the render settings, pick the HDRR that you like, and then go and save this all as a scene. Save it in a safe place that you know you know where it is, like maybe a Dropbox folder or something. Don't save it on your desktop, do, do it properly. Don't be like me, save it properly. Once you save that, you can go over here to Edit, Preferences, and then you can define that as a default scene when you open DAS Studio or when you create a new scene. It's a very, very good question, Casey. So you head over here to Startup, I think. And then you have this option here, On Launch, Load a File. So you just go and browse to that file that you've saved with a new HDRI in, and then you define that here. So that means every time you launch DAS Studio, this file is going to be there. Very important. There's another option closely related to that, and that's in scene here. You've got a similar dialog here, which means load a file when you create a new scene. And if you wanted that to be cohesive, no matter if you start that studio or if you want to create a new scene, you can define the same file and then your personal preference HDRI and whatever other settings that you have, maybe default camera, maybe default lighting set, maybe a default character even in the scene, could be loaded the moment you launch DAS Studio. So that'll save you a couple of clicks. Eight characters, that's a stretch for every computer, by the way. Uh, I would recommend you look into rendering billboards. So often you, do, you don't actually need the full geometry and all the full high resolution um, bits and pieces in the scene. Uh, loading types of a figure also very much depend on how many morph products you have installed. So the Lioness and I were talking about it, how greatly important it is to split up your runtimes into multiple uh, smaller portions of stuff that you use. So if you have one library and you install all the content that you have in there, then chances are that the Genesis figure takes a long time to load because uh, all the morphs are being loaded. It's one of those things we recommend against that. Yes, Camilla, it's it's exactly so. It's uh, if you have nothing other than the base character and maybe like three or four other characters installed, loading time is actually fairly quick. But if you have fifty or a hundred characters installed, then all these little sliders that I've shown you, each of these needs to be loaded in when when you load in a base figure. Even if you're not using the sliders, the moment they're mapped, the moment that Studio says, "Okay, I need to go and and load these in," this is why that takes so long. If you have a hundred characters installed, custom characters, you have several hundred sliders in the base figure that all need to be loaded. And that's why some, some people uh, literally have to wait 10 minutes. I had somebody tell me once he had to wait over an hour for the Genesis figure to load. That's too long. But I think he had literally every product under the sun. So, so okay, let's say we're happy with the lighting. Like many of us, we do recommend click and render IBL sets. Uh, I, I'm going to buy all of them because they're just they're just a game changer for how I approach a portrait. I'm not going to talk about how to set up a light from the back. I've done that in previous um, live streams, and I'm sure we're going to get there. Uh, we're going to revisit that topic. I want to talk about how what do you now do in order to get a picture out of Das Studio. Let's talk about render settings. So we've seen that when I switch over my viewport to iRay, I can get a preview render, but how do I save that? That that's just a preview render that's turning my viewport into the iRay version of what my image is going to look like. On the render settings tab, you've got this big blue button here, and that will render a standalone picture in the dimensions that are defined under general here. So currently that's going to be a 1200 by 1200 image. And it'll use whatever the default settings are in uh, in Das Studio. Let me just go and bring this back to the default. That's this, and that is off. So there we go. So by default, it will look at 
uh, how, so I can do this control R or the blue button and then I'll just go ahead and do something and it'll it'll give me a picture and sometimes it'll take quite a while to load depending on what the image resolution is what your hardware is and what your other settings are so I'm gonna go let it run and I'll just keep an eye on this little window here this is telling me if this is uh, if, if it's not showing just go and enable that and then you see the you see the status messages here that Das Studio shows you while um, while you render and this is an important thing to keep track of so currently we see the elapsed time but we also see how many iterations das studio is is calculating here meanwhile keep an eye on what your picture looks like the longer you let it render the less grainy it becomes uh, the longer you let it render also the longer it'll take to render so if you have a slowish type computer then uh, this might take a while you might not be happy with whatever comes out so i will go and show you some bits and pieces uh, <laughs> x201 i will do that in a minute and i will show you some bits and pieces of uh, how to get the most out of it so currently das studio reckons it's kind of done 50 odd percent and it makes that calculation by default by how much of the image is converged. That's a bit of a weird word because technically you could render forever because it's just random light bounces that go into your scene and you could do this forever is basically what the sun does it shines onto earth practically forever every once in a while you know it takes a break when when it's night but other than that it just constantly shines it never has to stop but since we want to use our computer for other things we would like iray to stop at one point and while I'm looking at my picture, there's, there's things that we can improve, like you know, depth, depth of field. There's accessorizing pieces, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about that maybe. But right now, it's just you know, it's it's saying it's seventy percent done because seventy percent of the image is converged. And what it means by that, I think, and I'm not entirely sure about this, but what I think it means is seventy percent of my image has no grain in it anymore. Seventy percent of my image has been reached by calculated pixels so 70 percent has been calculated now currently it's 78 percent so you know it's going up and up and it'll do that until it reaches a particular value that is on the render settings tab under progressive uh, render under a thing with render quality enabled which is the default it'll tell you the rendering converged ratio is 95 percent so it'll keep rendering until 95 percent of my image have converged at which point it will stop and no matter how long that takes no matter um, what the image is going to look like at that one point das studio or rather iray is going to make the decision hey 95 percent have been converged i can now stop if you like to increase your render quality, there's several approaches to that. One is that you can increase the converged ratio. That's going to be tricky because if you're waiting for 100% convergence, a lot of bounces need to happen for literally every single pixel to be calculated. So not recommended. The other approach that you can take is to crank up the render quality value from one to something else like five or 10. Then it'll it'll i'm not entirely sure actually what it does because i don't work that way but it'll it'll take longer to render and the quality of the picture is apparently better but again it's something i don't really like this this whole idea of something you know telling me when a render looks good or not as far as i'm concerned for the last two minutes it looked pretty pretty decent so i don't really need to have you know currently five thousand four and a half thousand iterations and we're still not done so as far as i'm concerned for what i'm doing this is actually enough oh actually das studio agrees with me it has just stopped so there we go interesting so i'll show you another way of working which is by disabling the render quality so by doing that it won't look at the convergence anymore and will only look at the amount of samples you tell das studio to to render out before we do anything let's go and save our picture just so that we have records of what we've what we've done this took about like four minutes to calculate there's two ways of saving in das studio uh, that is determined by this little um this little icon here if it's a folder icon it lets you pick a destination on your computer with this menu and i might just go and pick something on my desktop i think we have stream test in it i might just create myself a renders folder i called it redness that's that's a shame isn't it let's call it renders there we go 
And if I select that folder, then I can give it a name down here and I call it a uh, test render. And then I can hit save and that'll save this image in the format that I've selected there. I've, I've picked PNG, uh, you can also pick JPEG, you can pick TIFF, you can pick uh, all kinds of other options and that'll save that image. There's another way of uh, of saving something and that is into the render library and that was the other little thing. Render library is a particular folder on your uh, hard drive that Dash Studio sets up. You can create other render libraries. This is a bit like what Poser used to do. They have a render library and it makes it easy for you to go and have a look at renders that you've made. So it's, you know, you can you can define other render libraries here. I rarely use it. I thought I'll use it on this occasion just to, to show you how that works. When we render the next picture, I'll show you how to save something to your render library. So let's talk another about let's talk about disabling render quality. So with it enabled, sorry, I wanted to say this. Uh, with it enabled, it render until it reaches this convergence value, taking into consideration the quality value. But it'll only do that for a maximum amount of time. So currently it says or a maximum number of samples. So it looks at both these things, and as long as neither of these values are reached, it'll keep rendering. So seven. 7,200, this is seconds here. 7,200 seconds is, I don't actually know what that is. Let's uh, let's figure it out. 7,200 divided by 60, that's minutes, so that's two hours. The maximum render time by default will be two hours or 5,000 samples. But if you switch this off, then it will go and only look at these two values here, max samples and max time. So if I say max samples, um, say 100, with render quality disabled, if I go and render this again, I'll go and see that my render is going to be done a lot faster. But also it's not going to look as good as it did with 5000 samples, of course, because, you know, after 100, we're already done. And I'm thinking, well, there's still a lot of grain in there, so I might need more, but I also might not need 5000. And by um, judging the amount of samples, I personally feel I have a better way of judging uh, how much a render needs to render. This is the trick that X201 was talking about, this uh, this special thing. If you think, hey, I've rendered 100 and it took me a certain amount of time, I would love it if I could just, you know, if I close the render down and start rendering again, I, maybe at a higher um, max samples rate, I'd have to render the first 100 samples again. But Das Studio has an option to resume the render and increase the render samples building on what you've already rendered. And that happens here when you're on this window here, before you close down your, your render, there's this little tab here. If you hover over that, if you click that, then this this um, additional menu comes up. And on here, under progressive render, you have your max samples, which you can now increase if you wish. So maybe we'll have a look at what happens at 250 renders. Hit return. And then at the bottom here, that uh, previous um, grayed out button is turned into resume and I can go and resume my render now and now Das Studio tells me that it's starting basically at ray, at, at ray bounce number 101 and keeps rendering and keep adding to my uh, to my to my uh, render here and it, now it looks a little bit better so I could keep doing this I could say well maybe I want to I want to do 500 I just do this and say resume and you know see what happens then and you know keep increasing my renders uh, find my um, my ideal render values. I've got to tell you, all render applications essentially are the same. All the uh, all the what are they called non-biased render engines that work like iRay, and all of them have an issue with grain. So no matter how much or how little you render, you, unless you render a lot of ray bounces, you'll always have little pieces of grain there. I'm not going to save this actually. I'm just going to go close this and show you where the where the denoiser is because that's a bit of a game changer for me to make sure I can render with lower amount of samples but still make sure there's no grain in my picture. So even with 500 samples, there was still a substantial amount of grain in there. And um, that is down here under filtering, also under the render settings tab under filtering. Head over here to post denoiser available. You have to 
select two things. One is post denoiser available. And then there's another option that's usually disabled, which is post denoiser enabled. So first you have to make it available and then you have to enable it. And now the denoiser is going to kick in after what it says here, eight iterations. And now if I hit control R or hit the big, big blue button, my image is going to come to life. And after about eight bounces, it'll kick in. And at first it'll go look a little bit weird because there's just not a lot of, uh, not a lot of iterations that it can make sense of. But whereas it starts adding more iterations, you have a completely grain free image. And that's just, that's just very nice. And that's how I usually work. I put a uh, render resolution, I disable the render quality, I set my samples for previews to around 100, 200 pixels, for final renders to about 1000 to 2000, something like that, sometimes 5000, rare, rare instances. I set the resolution to something that I want to end up with, and I switch the denoiser on, and that's basically it. That is, uh, that is what I do. And this is now a very ungrainy render that looks pretty okay, especially if all I do with it is post it on uh, on Instagram. It's very important to remember. I remember my, my friend Durrell told me that about uh, qualities of textures and of HDRIs and all and, and render quality. And you don't need to render at 10,000 by 10,000 pixels at 10,000 iterations for eight hours overnight. If all you're doing is putting a 600 by 600 image onto your social uh, media page, you can get away with, with, you know, shorter render times. And, um, and you know, I, I recommend you do that for higher quality work. If it's for print, or if you want to sell an NFT, or if you want to do something really special, increase the iterations and see what happens. Let me show you how the render library saving thing works. So that is, if I wanted to save this into my render library, that is, I would just click this little icon at the bottom here and switch it to the little picture thing that will give me a choice of what render library I'd like to use. I can define multiple. I can hit accept and I can go and give it a name. I'll just call it test render. I hit save and then the window's going to close out. Uh, under here we should now, he says, <laughs> we should now, there we go, there it is. There's my test render. So now if I wanted to have it in an album, easily accessible, I can, I can get, I can get that. I think I can double click it, opens in the photos app from which I can then go and save it and do something else with, like, you know, use it in Photoshop or whatever. What else? I have a feeling there's something else I wanted to tell you in regards to render settings. We've done content, we've done a little bit of tool settings. We've done how to get around in Dash Studio. We've done lights. I think the only other thing I would just like to do before I have a look at the questions is I'm going to go and accessorize this character a little bit. So I'm thinking maybe there's kind of a, a nose ring, maybe there's earrings, maybe there's a necklace. I'll just have a quick look if I find something and then we can go and bring this to a close. So under accessories, this is another thing I didn't tell you about in the content, right? Let's do this, especially now that I'm looking for accessories. If I head over here and I'm on products, then these things will show me what products I have that have accessories. So like this product here, old style glasses have glasses as accessories. Uh, this product here, Young Minto has also got glasses as accessories. Maybe then this um, Kuhn here has a bit of a headband as accessories, but it's slightly cumbersome to go into every product and see the combined global bucket of accessories I have, like, you know, maybe I'm looking for a necklace, maybe I'm looking for something else. I can go and switch this over from products to files. And if I do that, then I get a whole list of all files across all products. And maybe I have a face mask here. I can try that out. What happens if I double click? We have her with a face mask. That's quite nice. Or we can have the Rycroft necklace that she could wear. Depends on if this is going to go. Now it's going to intersect with the outfit, so I'm not going to use that. And then there's like the disco flare necklace that I could try on. That might work. Kind of works. Cool. I like that. I like that. Might leave that there. There's things for hairs. There's also the other funky glasses here. There's things for, there's like iPods here. That's, that's nice. Or maybe there's a headset. Let me wear her, have her wear the headset. <laughs> Interesting. She's got glasses and a headset. That's nice. Maybe we can, we can do that. Either that or earrings. Oh, there's also, maybe we're going to go all out and do the, the Bluetooth headset here. That should work. Yeah, there we go. That's nice. No earrings. 
perfect. Maybe there's a kind of a nasal piercing. I think this one here, eye and nose ring, that'll work. Boom. Uh, hello? Nose ring. Oh, there it is. Where's the nose ring? Nose ring is here. Oh, that's not that's not good, is it? That's <laughs> that would need adjustment. It's by a foot. Uh, so no nose ring then. Let's see what else we can. Whoops. Hello. No, 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 no. That's not what we meant. Good thing we have that undo option. And I will have a look at questions in a moment. Accessories. The iron. Anything else like a piercing? I've got the pacifier. That would work. So no nose ring. Don't worry about it. We, we could adjust it. Oh, there it is. Nose ring on the nose. Let's do that. Ding. There we go. Perfect. <laughs> Let me go and render this. Was it camera three? Yes, there it is. Camera three under render settings. I might go and uh, crank this up a little bit. 1200 by 1200 is okay. I'll say... I say thousand iterations. And let's say that's my that's my final render. I hit Control R, and then I'll just go let it rip. There's also um, this is something I'll I'll show you where that is. I don't know if I can do it while we're rendering. Yeah, no, I can't do it. Um, depending on the hardware that you have, you might want to enable or disable certain things in the advanced render settings. And it's just so um, I just wanted to know. I want you to know where that is. Yeah, so the chain doesn't work great, so I'd have to adjust it. But you know. I'll leave that for another day. So advanced render settings are kind of cool to um, for um, kind of cool to get comfortable with just just to see what's where. So you may run into an issue as you work with more detailed characters, more characters in your scene, more geometry in your scene that your graphics card can't handle the amount of data that needs to be put into it so that the scene can get rendered. So the process of how this works is this, this before we see a picture here, what iRay does is, or what that studio does is, it loads off all the assets and sends it to your GPU usually. The GPU needs to have everything in its VRAM memory and then starts rendering the stuff. But if you run out of VRAM, then your GPU can't render. And sometimes what happens then is that your computer will start rendering with the CPU only. And that takes about five to 10 times longer than what your GPU can do usually. I'll go and save this number two in my render library. And that's where this uh, tab of advanced on the render settings on the advanced, this is kind of worth having a look at. So this is the render engine that you're picking up here. So NVIDIA iRay is what we want. You could also use 3D Light. You could also use your viewport, which means whatever is selected in the viewport would come out. So iRay is what we want. Then under here, under hardware, these are the devices that you're rendering with. So I could enable my CPU in addition to my GPUs, or I could say, hey, I have, I only want to render with one GPU. You can switch that off. Or I can say, well, my GPUs don't even show up here. I don't have a choice but to render with the CPU. So you can still use it. You can still use iRay, but it'll take you significantly longer to do this. You can even overwrite this and literally have connect to um, a cloud render service and then have the cloud render for you without using your own hardware. This is something else we're going to discuss next year. It's, it's very cool that's happening here under the bridge tab. You can literally specify an iRay server and then render this, whatever you're rendering, on completely different hardware, different computer on your local network or in the cloud. So kind of nice. But what I wanted to bring uh, to your attention under advanced hardware is these options at the bottom here. So I have this switched up, allow G CPU fallback. So this is, I think this is enabled by default. I have it disabled, which means that when I render something that doesn't fit into my GPU's memory, I just get a black picture. Das Studio says, hey, I've tried it, boom, black. There's nothing else that's happening. Uh, I like it that way because that means I need to do something about the texture sizes so that it fits into my GPUs. But if I don't want that, I could enable this, which requires a Das Studio restart. And at that point, if it doesn't fit into the GPU's VRAM, I would just go, Das Studio would say, okay, no worries, I'll just use the CPU. I hope you don't mind if it takes a little longer. So that's uh, that's that's something, it's an important switch to know about uh, in case you do get renders that fail and you want them to work, uh, this is a switch to look at. If you would like something to fit 
into your GPU's memory, but the scene you're trying to render is too large, look into the Scene Optimizer product by VG, V3 Digitimes. That's an excellent tool that will go through all the textures in your scene and it'll reduce them and save them out into a folder of your choice. I believe I've talked about this on, on earlier occasions. So yes, there we go. That is That is important to remember. Tell you what, We've talked a lot about Das Studio. Let me show you once again the time lapse I've, I've shown you in the beginning uh, while I have a look at um, at your questions, at your excellent, excellent questions. Yes, Camilla, I totally agree. Your scene optimizer is quite, quite awesome. This is essentially the process I go through every time. Load a character, pose a character, dress a character, make adjustment, 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 have a look at lights, and then um, uh, see how happy you are. Make more adjustments to expressions as well as colors. Make sure the light kind of interacts. In this case, I've also set up a strong backlight, as you'll soon see, and I've also set up depth of field. But I've talked about that on previous occasions, so I'm going to go and have a look at what my friendly moderators have put um, on our big, big questions board, and then I'll, I'll totally do some questions. Oh my goodness, X201, you're building a Lego Ghostbusters Echo 1 over Christmas. That's exciting. <laughs> very, very cool. Pamela, a question. Anyone does anyone know how to make Genesis Genesis 8 expressions work on Genesis 8.1? Do you know what? There is in fact an article on my website that will explain how to do this. I'm gonna go and dig it out and maybe you can actually, Julia, maybe you can do it. It is I, I don't actually know what it's called anymore. Ha! If you look for expressions, I will totally tell you. Let me just have a look. It's on verselewis.com, a wonderful website where I take all my 3D notes. And I think if you just look for expressions there, it'll probably come up. The seams on Genesis 8.1 and how to make them work. That's what this, what it's called. So for expressions, I again, this is it seems to be different for uh, for people. Pamela, this one is for you here. This is a link that explains how I make the seams work on Genesis uh, between 8 and 8.1. There's dummy files that you need to kind of delete and overwrite, and it'll work the same with expressions. So it's it's one of those things that some people have problems with expressions, and um, uh, some people have problems with the seams, and it's one of those things that, you know, I, I'm lucky in that I don't have a problem with expressions, but I did have the issue with the seams. Sensation Chaser. There's a question I'm still wondering. When I buy a character for which Michael 8 is required, if I do not own Michael 8, can I use it through Genesis 8 Mail? No, you cannot. That's a really good question. And um, I think they've updated the shopping cart on the desk store in which if you need a product that you don't have, it'll come up at the bottom and it'll kind of encourage you to buy it. And it's... Um, uh, it's something that's important. So sometimes a character requires nothing. All it needs is the, the Genesis 8 base um, details. But if you say, I think uh, Mona Lisa and I had this discussion on my YouTube channel. If you wanted to make a custom character and you use all the body morphs that I've shown you, you know, like, you know, hips bigger, size different and all that, you could literally use all those sliders and then save out a uh, um, character preset of that and you could even sell that but customers need to own the products that you've used to make those sliders appear if you don't have that michael will look um or the the, the figure that you're buying looks very different because it requires the michael morph and if you don't have that that studio will use all the other sliders but it it won't look as it does in the in the promo pictures i i've bought a product uh, a couple of years ago and i had exactly that problem i had i think it was based on the girl and it was based on something else that i didn't have and i dialed it up and i was thinking this looks terrible man this doesn't look at all like in the promo images and the reason for that was it was indeed i was missing one uh, one product so yes very very important very important point how can you get michael for lenny Storotska? Michael 4 is still on sale. Uh, I can show you where he is 
on the DAS store. All you do is up here. Oh, this is nice, actually. Join us live. Hey, this is good. I love it. Thank you, Travis. Really appreciate that. You just go to DAS3D.com. In fact, let me show you the front page. DAS3D.com. Top right-hand corner, Michael Four, and he usually comes up as a bundle. Uh, Michael for 3D model pro suite. He's in there, but you can also get him standalone. So if you just click on this, then uh, you get this bundle here for 109 bucks on the bottom of which it'll tell you Michael for base. Click on that. You probably want the bundle because you probably want uh, other bits and pieces with it. And there he is in all his glory. So yes, he's still available. It's just not a free figure. The Genesis figure was the generation after this genesis one a couple of years later was genesis two then we had genesis three currently we have eight and 8.1 so yes that is that is how that is how that works and you can still get him and he still works really well in poser stevel you always have problems with expressions and your characters always end up with a wonky face totally agree with you expressions are difficult so um what i can recommend for that is in fact have a look at this icons bundle it comes with a phenomenal amount of fairly good expressions uh, they are by das so they're das originals that these ones say genesis 8 female expressions as well as genesis 8 male expressions um, they are uh, also some head morphs that are important so these will get you started and if you combine those on the puppeteer tab like i've shown you before you can literally mix and match multiple of them together so this is this is one thing i would highly recommend you get these because they get you started with a lot of um, with a lot of sliders this is not a bad offer here especially if you're starting out like this cross resource kit is kind of cool uh, it comes with a few characters it's very good especially underbelly i love underbelly he's a really good character but if you want to take your expressions to the next level, there's a product that's called Face Controls. And it's by the same guy who made MetaMixer Toolkit. If only we knew where it was. There it is. Genesis 3 and 8 Face Controls. And it is currently on sale, which is cool. And it is something that's a very underrated product. This is an excellent product. This is fantastic. What you do is you add this faceplate to your Genesis 3 or 8 or 8.1 characters. This The system is kind of implemented in 8.1, but it only gives you the faceplate. So what this product gives you, first of all, compatibility with Genesis 3 and 8.0. But more importantly, and this is very much undersold on the page here, it will allow you to dial in many of the uh, phonemes and it'll allow you to add a lot of cool expressions. Now these don't go on the actual figure. These go on the faceplate that you apply to the figure first. And then you load those expressions and they're fantastic. They distort the face in, in ways that I haven't seen in regular expression slider products. And the cool thing is they are all very exaggerated, but with Puppeteer, you can really tone this down. You set one point on the neutral expression and then you set a couple of these and see what you like and then drag the slider towards that until you reach the expression that you like. So face controls for expressions as well as the expression morphs that are in uh, that are available for Genesis 8. 100% recommend that. Some of your questions I don't understand. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Richard uh, Halen on Parisian Loft HDR. I can't seem to get a lock of the character because everything looks so big. Please help. Um, I need to see a screenshot, I'm afraid. I don't know how to answer that, I'm afraid. Sensation Chaser, I noticed that the strange man is very much heavy for my computer in spite it seems to be more tuned than the other characters when I render. It takes a very long time, especially with all his hairs. That, you know, it's probably because of hairs. So hairs, they are either uh, additional geometry and Ira takes its sweet little time to, um, to calculate all the light bounces. So hair usually does that. <laughs> and I'm so glad you're so blown away, Steph. That's super cool. 
Super nice. I'm, I'm glad I could show you something that, um, you know, that, that is that is good. I like it. Richard P. Bossa, the content library is a complete mess, especially if you have a lot of legacy items that don't even show up right. Um, agreed. Yes, uh, it's, it's true. I often, I don't actually often use the regular content library. This one here. Uh, the smart content works better for me, but it only really works for content that you've bought from DAS. So content library, if you're buying a lot of content from Renderosity or from other marketplaces, you're probably more familiar with how this works. And this is something I find myself, I don't, I don't particularly like this. Uh, and I only go here when something in smart content isn't working. Uh, yeah, it's one of those things. Um, sometimes if you do work a lot with the content library, it's very well worth having a look at uh, the vendor's descriptions of where to find what in the product. So this is something that I encourage you to do if you have a product, like say it's face controls. And maybe I'll use face controls as an example here. It shows you the files that are on here. Sometimes it shows kind of a PDF or a readme file, which often gives clues as to how you're supposed to use something like that. So in here it says there's a tutorial video. There's also a dynamics um, uh, template. That's that's not what I meant. There's also, I know this, there's a PDF thing here, audio sample links for animation PDF. There's, a, there's actually a proper document on here. And this is something, maybe I should show you this as well. If you have a product and you're not entirely sure how to use it, and um, the meta mixer is a great example of that. If you have the meta mixer and you say, hey, um, how do I even use this thing? Isn't there, there's like a fast video with music underneath it. That doesn't really help me out. Isn't there something that's, that's written that I could, uh, that I, that could maybe help me? Yes, there is. So there, if you look for the particular product and I'm using install manager as an example and the meta mixer as an example. So meta mixer, here it is. It's not installed right now, but if it were, and we might, we could, we could just go do this. Let me go and let me just go install this then I can show you this better. So once it's installed, it'll go move from this tab via this tab over into the install tab. It'll, it'll be very quick. You can have a look through Install Manager for a list of all the files that come with your product. And one of them will also be usually be a link either to readme or proper PDF documentation. Usually vendors do this, that it's exposed inside the product in Dash Studio that you double click on something and a PDF actually opens. Like I'm thinking of Biscuits hair products and many other vendors, they, they choose to do that, that you have an icon like Zevo, for example, there's an icon that says documentation. You double click it, a PDF opens in your web browser and you can read what it's all about, or it gets you to a forum thread on the Dash site with more information, that sort of thing. MetaMixer toolkit. But if you don't have that, or if the vendor kind of forgot it, you go to the product in question. So like MetaMixer toolkit, there's this, once it's installed, there's this little triangular icon here. And if you click on that, you can see show installed files. Can we see that here? Yes, we can. Good stuff. Show installed files. And that should open up uh, this little dialog in which you see, in fact, a list of whatever is happening. So I encourage you to look through this because this was going to give you a clue where to find those files, not so much in the first of all, where exactly. And then well, this is the content library that you've got it on. And this is the actual path to the file. Uh, in case you find you don't find something in the smart content, this is the file that will definitely be in the content library. And if you look through here, there's going to be a PDF with instructions. Uh, sadly, I don't think there's a way to search for this. But if you look at this long list, it is actually there. I think it's at the bottom. Some swears. You what a shame. You could also just go to the actual product into the in your um, in your Windows Explorer. Maybe I'll do that if I just click on here. Then a Explorer window opens, and I say maybe I'll just go navigate back to Meta Mixer, or in fact, 42D. No, that's it. Meta Mixer is a universal. Is there anything like a PDF here? I have seen it. I just don't know where it is anymore. It could well be. It could well be even further. If I find it, I'll I'll certainly let you know. This, but this list of files. I guess my my point is this list of um, files uh, 
is something that you should have a look into if you have something. Let's also read me folder. Sometimes they're in there. Yeah, of course, on demo effect, I don't, I don't actually find it. But if you look through that list, you often find documentation uh, to your product. So you know, important thing to, important thing to make a, just a mental note of. Often it is there. Pamela, men are not compatible with women. No, that is um, that is true. So morphs for a man are not compatible for a female figure, and vice versa. That is that is true. There are ways around it. So if you are if you find that you have a male morph that you wish existed on a female figure, there's a seriously cool application that Brian's recently made a video about, and I've made a stream about. It's called, and this is something you know. This is kind of going off a, off a thing here. It's called, it's a website called Russian3dscanner.com and they have a product called Wrap3D and that lets you give it a source shape and a target shape and it will morph one shape into another and that does an awesome job at this. Uh, it's about 400 bucks uh, for an indie license. You can also get it as a, at a, as a prescription, I was going to say subscription, and it will do that. So this is something uh, you might want to look into. It's, it's great to turn people scans into a Genesis 8 character and in fact I'm going to make a video on this on the DAS channel that'll probably be released in January for products that uh, that are available for from 3DSK they do proper heads uh, proper body scans and uh, the video is going to be about how we use such scans with the Genesis character very very cool so you could then basically export a male character and then use that to create a morph on the female character possible where do you freeze a simulation again? Ascania. Yes, good point. Where do you do that? I like we have about five minutes. I'll, I'll try my best. If you had something, maybe we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll go create Ascania just for you. I'll go and create a brand new scene here. Free simulations on the parameters tab, if I remember correctly. And I will go and uh, show you this with a primitive plane onto which on the simulation settings with my plane selected. This is good. I'm having fun. This is exciting. I'm going to have a deforce dynamic surface modifier on here. On the parameters tab under simulation, here's free simulation. Boom, there it is. Only works on objects that have D4 supplied. Ha! Lira! Lira Madrill, good to see you. It is, um, I've been a fan of yours for a while, actually. Good, good that you asked that. Posa trained me never to click on a figure directly. 100% correct. Yes, me too. I hardly ever do that. That's where the scene outliner really shines. Very, very cool. Cake one, wonderful to see you too. Love your lighting products. Am I the only one who uses dials all the time? No, no, no. It's a combination kind of effort. I think many people use the dials. It's all good. Uh, Neil, about the CMS problems, it's, I, you'd need to be more specific, I'm afraid. Uh, tuna times four, how do I find those keyboard shortcuts? Very, very good question for navigation and everything else. Uh, how to find keyboard shortcuts, how to, how to define your own, how to make all that happen. Window, workspace, customize. This is where you, this is, a, this is the place to be really. And in here, for the navigational shortcuts, they're at the bottom here, view controls, uh, controls for orbit, rotate, pan, dolly. And this is also where you can define your own. So you double click into this, if we actually do see it, yes, you double click into this and then you define your new shortcut. So maybe I want to use Alt, so Alt, left click, I'll do that and it'll be Alt, left mouse button. Or I can double click and uh, set this back to Control, Alt, left click. The new modifier conflicts with the viewport action. Do you wish to continue? Yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay with that. There we go. That's where you define that. And this is also where you can define other shortcuts. So on the actions menu here, say you had something, I don't know, under create, and you want to create a new group, and you want to do this so often that you that you want to have control shift G for that to be a shortcut. You find that item here, double click into this empty space, 
No, you don't. You right click into this empty space and say change keyboard shortcut. And then it says press a key sequence and say you go control shift uh, G then that's your shortcut setup and next time you click that that'll be the that'll be your shortcut all right there are a lot of questions i might i might take another five minutes or so what is the name of this panel to get to those points i'm sure you might be referring to the power pose no not the power pose yes the power pose the power pose which only shows up if we do have the templates installed and a figure loaded so if i go and go back to my uh, stream safe textures which are probably under figures some swears and these points will show up yes power pose tab that's the one. And they will only show up if you install the following exciting products. They're called, just if you, if you search for power, you'll see the Genesis male and female power post templates. I believe there are also some for Genesis 3. I don't know if I've installed. I don't think I have them installed. Maybe they come automatically with the, with the Genesis uh, 3 figure with the, um, what's it called? Starter essentials is what I'm saying. Hope that clears it up. Oh, and then of course there's power pose here. That's the one with the points. That's power pose. The 3D, manip the 3D manipulator is not something you need to purchase. No, thank you for asking. Uh, I have Das Studio 4.11. Should I update? Yes, you should, because uh, so what I recommend is if you have a working version and you want to try out another version and you're not quite ready to wipe out the version that you're using, grab yourself the Das Studio beta version. So on the Das website, search for Das Studio beta, and that will bring up a product that is called, in fact, the Das Studio Pro Beta. And if you, it's a free product, so you just add it to your card and you check out, and that will let you install multiple versions, well, two versions of Das Studio, the current release version and a new beta version. The beta version is often ahead of the release branch. And like in your case, if you're still on 4.11 and you know it works on your system, I wouldn't jeopardize this. I would say, you know what, I'm going to have the beta running side by side and then I can have the best of both worlds. You can switch back to 4.11 and you can use 4.16 and see what that's all about. If for any reason that's not working on your system, you still have 4.11. True story. LD Baywood, for depth of field, do you only need to have one selected for near depth of field and far, or is it better for both? I usually um, go by the uh, by the midpoint and then adjust the area that I'd like to be in focus, encapsulating the part of my character that's important to me. So um, I usually don't worry about adjusting the front and the back manually. I, I think like a photographer in terms of f-stop values, and I usually adjust it by that. And to me, it means something thing if I have say I had a say I had a camera here create new camera copy perspective view fine camera is here camera selected on the parameters uh, hello camera selected under parameters under camera there I usually think in these terms of f-stop so in in f-stop terms then something like eight gives more is, gives a more shallow depth of field than something like 32 so i very much think in these terms but you can set them separately it really depends on what's what's easier for you to uh, work with steph yes basically if you want to do something for nfts and you want to have a portrait that looks good adjust this value here focal length from its default 65 to something i'd say above 100 use best judgment but something between 120 and 200 is going to look very flattering on your models and it's going to look good on on portraits if you stick with 65 it's going to work if you go lower than that that's usually for you know interiors architectural type shots but not so much for people for people we're talking you know we're talking something like between 100 and 200 
And you probably also want to use depth of field. I've got a tutorial on my channel about this and I've talked about this on, on other occasions in the streams. But yes, that's absolutely, that is, that's, that's a good one to use. And it makes this, um, makes portraits just look so much cooler. Like on the Asian lady that I've shown you before, she has depth of field enabled. Let me see, uh, just, just to show you, I don't think I have a before and after. Actually, I have it in her, I have it in my render library, don't I? Haha. -ha is this guy he has depth of field and the focal point is his eyes and then the depth of field is fairly shallow so literally his nose onwards is already not in depth of field and then his eyes also his sorry his ears and and further is already uh, not in focus anymore can you see that this is what depth of field brings to the party so it kind of focuses the viewer in on on one particular thing one aspect we haven't quite talked about is post-production. So usually what I do with any of my, my stuff is I put it into Photoshop and make some finishing touches there. I just want you to know that Photoshop isn't the only program that you can use for that. If you have nothing uh, to do post-production with, resizing, retouching, putting vignettes on, doing color corrections, that sort of stuff, um, Photoshop isn't everyone's cup of tea. The learning curve is pretty pretty high and it's 10 bucks a month so i understand that people say hey i don't really i'm not i'm not a fan of that there are other alternatives and one of which is currently on sale over on humble bundle that is uh, paint shop pro it comes in a really good bundle with paint shop pro which works a bit like photoshop it has great effects if you want to do post production uh, it also comes in a bundle with painter and a video editor and a ton of brushes for under 30 bucks so it's it's, it's well worth looking into uh, Brian, if you can put that link into the description, that'd be really cool. It's called the Create with Impact Bundle, I believe. And um, yes, it's it's a lot of products for a very low price. Perpetual license as well, so you can keep it forever. And if you don't have Photoshop and you need to do things like color corrections, that's your way to go. There are free options, but um, GIMP and Krita, they're, they're, on a, they're on a different level uh, right now. So I don't really recommend those because high learning curve, free, but also it takes a bit of getting used to. <laughs> My friends, I think that is all I have for today. I'm just having one last look. Can we use the scale tool, Michael? Yes, you can. You can do that. Sometimes it's disabled, but yes, in principle, you can use it. Uh, can't you just scale the glasses? I was, I was on the, yes, that is a possibility. Um, that, that would have been a possibility. Just make them wider. That's actually a great idea to do that. And Camilla says, Jay's making it harder than it really needs to be. Oh, what a shame. <laughs> If there are tips that, that you think I should apply, please let me know. <laughs> are your glasses parented or targeted to fit the character? Good point. So Yoshi, that's a very that's a very good discussion to have. Some accessories are fully rigged, others are so-called smart props. If they're smart props, they can be moved around the scene, very easily adjusted. If they're fully rigged, they often have issues. Often it's overkill to have a fully rigged thing that just sits on your nose. While it follows your nose, it is often distorting when you apply face morphs. And so if you do come across these things, um, I recommend you export them as an OBJ, import them back and turn them into your own smart prop. If something is ever rigged and you don't want it to be, you can uh, you can use that. So it's it's literally if you had uh, a camera isn't a good example or a character isn't a good example. But if you ever in that situation where you have something like glasses and they're rigged and you think, hey, this this isn't working well for me, my, my manipulator is down here the glasses are up here how am i going to ever adjust that that's just that's just not good uh, two things you could try um one is fiddle with the mesh transforms the other is literally a, a gung-ho thing in which you say export as obj and then you import it again via the same dialog file import and that will remove the rigging you can still apply all the materials to it uh, but that's that sometimes makes your life a bit easier is 3D Light LD Baywood, is 3D Light the same as filament PBR or is it different render than iRay uh, and the sensation chaser and the difference between iRay and filament? Very good questions. Yes, that is, that's a very good question. 3D Light is a CPU based biased render engine that is compliant with the render man standard and it has kind of almost like a toonish type look. It fakes 
rendering three objects with something that isn't compatible with PBR. Um, PBR means physically based rendering. So it applies similar princes, principles in a render world than, than are available in the real world. And, um, the, and IRA is a PBR engine, which is why PBR maps are compatible with it. But 3D Light is a different um, render engine altogether. It's kind of the older style render engine. It's still there. It has a different way of describing surfaces. And therefore, most assets include something that is uh, that is both an RSL shader as well as a as a PBR shader. Let's go and look at Victoria, for example. Victoria has uh, things that say MDL here, and it's got the same eyebrows as RSL. So if you were to use the 3D Light render engine, you would use these. And if you'd use iRay, you'd use these things here. You can switch that over under render settings. And so, um, uh, 3D Light, much like iRay, is meant to be the final render. You wouldn't necessarily use it for previews, even though there is a way to do this with a tab called the uh, the kind of the PBR preview, the sorry, the um, interactive preview render. You change this up here. So 3D Light, if I change this and now click render, like Control R, then my GPUs are not being used, and instead my my CPU is being used to uh, render. And it's a very different thing uh, than, than iRay. So iRay is more for photorealistic images, whereas 3D Light, I'd say, is more for cartoonish type style images. Filament, how does filament fit in? Filament is also a PBR engine, so it's also phys physically based, it's unbiased, but it's much faster. It's also much less accurate than iRay. And there we go. That's what she looks like in 3D Light. So it's kind of, you know, it's got the, the old style look on there. Lights behave very differently. HDRIs behave very differently. So it's kind of almost fallen out of favor. But if you don't have a good enough GPU, you can still get renders out of Dash Studio with, um, with 3D Light. A uh, final question I'm going to answer from Steph. Is there a way to deactivate characters when launching Dash Studio and just activating those will work with? Do you know what? No. The only thing you can do is either uninstall those characters, then they won't be loaded, or you can install different characters to different libraries. It's a little bit like what I've done here in my content library. It's an important thing to talk about. I have various libraries here. I've got this one, which is the, the default DAS library. I've got one for characters and I've got one for outfits. Those three are also mapped in my install manager. Let me show you where that is. That's under this little gear icon here. Advanced settings. Under installation, I have the same three folders mapped. When I install something, I can install it into a particular library. So example, character A and character B. I can install character A into here and character B into here. If all these are mapped and I load a Genesis figure in, then both character dials will be available in Dash Studio. If I have both of these installed in different folders and I go ahead and unmap my characters library here, like remove base directory, I, I load in a new figure, then whatever character was installed in here will not be loaded. And that's a way for you to speed up loading times. Very, very good question. And it's something that's a little bit niche, but we've all run into this problem. So um, what, what the Lioness and I always um, recommend to you is literally install different characters to different libraries. If you have a thousand characters in your library, let's say if you had a hundred characters in your library, make 10 libraries and in install 10 characters in different libraries and then map and unmap the ones that you want to load for a project. In fact, install the characters that you're using for a particular project into a project direct into a project library. Unmap that project library when you're making when you have a new project going. So that's a way of, of minimizing load times there. And um, 
Thistle Down's name. Yes, there is a way to remap the orbit button, like I said, under Window Workspace uh, Customize under under that section here. Window Workspace Customize down here. Uh, remap the orbit button so that we've had that already. That's cool. <laughs> and LD Baywood, yes, this program totally goes deep. Alrighty, I think that is it. That is all I have for today. If you do have other questions, though, don't hesitate to leave a comment in the description here on in the underneath the YouTube video. We will check them periodically, and if it's something that I can help with, either I will answer them, or even better, I will make a video of them. You can also ask on social media if you have a question and you, it just pops into your head and you think, "Hey, I wonder if someone of the DAS team knows the answer." Hashtag Ask DAS 3D. That will will we'll monitor that every so often. And if you do have a question, you know, do ask it there. My friends, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. We've gone over three hours, but hey, Das Studio is just such a deep, deep program. And I hope you're going to have lots of fun with it. Um, one thing I want to I want to share with you is that uh, in all my years of working with 3D applications, I've been probably more frustrated than I was happy with them. It's only that in the last few years that I've really really become happy and content and super excited about 3D. For the first five years or so, it was a serious uphill struggle. So if you're saying, look, this is too complex, I, I hear you, man. It's, it, it is. It's because the subject matter of 3D is extremely deep and complex. There's so much that you need to know about and especially in the beginning, it is extremely difficult even to type the right questions into Google to get something resembling the right answer in there. So the good thing is that we ha now have a DAS Discord server, the non-fungible people, and that is open to everyone to join. There's a, DAS, there's a DAS channel in which you can ask questions and get great help from the community. There's also the DAS forums. Don't be afraid to ask questions in there. There's usually people in there who are very, very happy to help you, uh, especially if you don't know what to ask for. So I think what I'd like to what I what I'm trying to say is don't be discouraged. Uh, make sure you do what is fun for you. Make sure you enjoy what you do. Don't let this thing annoy you. Don't let it frustrate you. Don't let the learning experiences that seem to be too difficult detract you from keeping going. You'll get there and eventually you'll be flying around that studio and you'll you really enjoy it. But it'll take some time to get used to it. I say don't give up and keep going. This is a wonderful program. There's nothing quite like it, and I've, I've really fallen in love with it uh, over the years, and especially now that I'm learning so many other new tools like ZBrush and Substance Painter, Marvelous Designer and Blender, they all come together. Then, of course, there's the post-production tools like um, Painter, Photoshop, uh, Paint Shop Pro, and all these other, Clip Studio Paint, all these exciting things that really make, make life a wonderful, wonderful experience in the 3D world. So don't give up and stick at it. If if it annoys you, take a step back and say, no, 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 you want to follow the passion. You really want to follow what you like. I'll leave you with that, my friends. Have a wonderful, wonderful night. Take care. Thank you for joining me.